provisoire du Conseil, j'invite M. Karim Khan, procureur de la Cour pénale internationale, à participer à la présente séance. Il en est ainsi décidé. Le Conseil de sécurité... Pardonnez-moi. Conformément à l'article 39 du règlement intérieur provisoire du Conseil, j'invite son Excellence, M. Joseph Borrell Fontaine, au représentant de l'Union européenne pour les affaires étrangères et la politique de sécurité, à participer à la présente séance. Il en est ainsi décidé. Conformément à l'article 37 du règlement intérieur provisoire du Conseil, j'invite les représentants de l'Allemagne, du Bélarus, de la Lituanie, de la Pologne, de la Tchéquie et de l'Ukraine à participer à la présente séance. Il en est ainsi décidé. Le Conseil de sécurité va maintenant aborder l'examen du point 2 de l'ordre du jour. Je souhaite chaleureusement la bienvenue au secrétaire général, au Premier ministre, aux ministres et aux autres représentants de haut niveau. Votre présence aujourd'hui témoigne de l'importance de la question à l'examen. Je donne maintenant la parole au secrétaire général, son Excellence, M. Antonio Guterres. Madame la Présidente, Excellence. La guerre menée par la Russie en Ukraine ne montre aucun signe de répit. Les sept derniers mois ont été marqués par une souffrance et une désolation indicible. Les événements récents sont dangereux et alarmants. Ils nous éloignent de toute perspective de paix et nous rapprochent d'un cycle sans fin d'horreur et de carnage. Je l'ai dit et je le répète. Cette guerre insensée peut faire des dégâts infinis en Ukraine et dans le reste du monde. L'idée d'un conflit nucléaire autrefois impensable est aujourd'hui évoquée par certains. Rien que cela est totalement inacceptable. Tous les États dotés d'armes nucléaires devraient de nouveau s'engager à ne pas les utiliser et à les éliminer progressivement de leur arsenal. Je suis également très préoccupé par des informations faisant état de plans visant à organiser de prétendus référendats dans les régions d'Ukraine qui ne sont actuellement pas sous le contrôle de son gouvernement. Toute annexation du territoire d'un État par un autre État par la menace ou le recours à la force constitue une violation de la Charte des Nations Unies et du droit international. Madame la Présidente, des milliers de civils ukrainiens, dont des centaines d'enfants, ont été blessés ou tués, la plupart par des bombardements russes dans des zones urbaines. Chaque jour en moyenne, cinq enfants sont tués ou blessés. Presque tous les enfants d'Ukraine sont traumatisés par le cauchemar de la guerre, exposés à des violences ou séparés de leur famille. Quelques 14 millions de personnes, dont une majorité de femmes et d'enfants, ont dû fuir. La situation ne peut qu'empirer alors que l'hiver s'approche et que les approvisionnements en gaz et en électricité s'amenuisent. Au niveau mondial, ce conflit a provoqué une triple crise alimentaire, énergétique et financière qui a précipité des millions de personnes supplémentaires dans l'extrême pauvreté et la faim réduisant à néant les années de progrès vers le développement et euh, étant ensuite des crises du Covid et de l'impact croissant de, du changement climatique. Les dommages collatéraux de cette guerre se font sentir dans des dizaines de pays en développement qui peinaient déjà à se relever de la pandémie du Covid-19 et à faire face à la crise climatique. Les plus vulnérables sont les premiers touchés. L'ONU travaille sans relâche pour pleinement exploiter toute opportunité d'atténuer les souffrances, notamment lors de mes déplacements en Ukraine, en Fédération de Russie et dans la région, et dans le cadre de mes échanges directs avec le président Zelensky et le président Poutine. 
ensemble avec nos partenaires humanitaires sur le terrain, nous sommes venus en aide à près de 13 millions de personnes dans le besoin. Il est essentiel que le personnel humanitaire puisse intervenir en toute sécurité et sans entrave auprès de tous ceux qui ont besoin d'aide ou qui où qu'il soit. Madam President, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights has been documenting the unacceptable impact of this war on human rights. The reports are a catalogue of cruelty, summary execution, sexual violence, torture, and other inhumane and degrading treatment against civilians and prisoners of war. The latest accounts of burial sites in Izium are extremely disturbing. All these allegations must be thoroughly investigated to ensure accountability. Perpetrators must be held to account in fair and independent judicial proceedings, and victims and their families have a right to justice, remedy, and reparation. Ending impunity for international crimes is fundamental. In all this, the International Criminal Court plays an important role to ensure effective accountability. The prosecutor of the court has opened an investigation into the situation in Ukraine. Full cooperation with the court by all parties is essential. Madam President, the fact-finding fact mission I established following the tragic incident at the detention facility in Olenivka on 29th of July is ready to deploy as soon as all necessary assurances are received. The missions must have safe, secure, and unfettered access to all relevant places and people and to all relevant evidence without any limitation, impediment, or interference. Madam President, the situation at the site of Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, located in the middle of a war zone, remains a cause of grave concern. The International Atomic Energy Agency is consulting with all parties involved on measures to ensure the safety of the plant and surrounding areas, I thank IAEA for its work. Its continued presence at the plant is an important deterrent. All attacks on nuclear facilities must end, and the purely civilian nature of such plants must be re-established. Any damage to nuclear infrastructure, whether deliberate or not, could have terrible consequences for people around the plant, about the plant and far beyond. The world cannot afford a nuclear catastrophe. Madam President, yesterday's news that more than 2050, 250 prisoners of war were exchanged between Ukraine and the Russian Federation was a welcome development. I commend the efforts of both parties and hope that they will build on these with further exchanges aiming at an all-for-all -all formula. And I thank the governments of Turkey and Saudi Arabia for their role in securing this agreement. In July, also with the support of the government of Turkey, a landmark deal was reached enabling the resumption of food and fertilizer exports from three of Ukraine's Black Sea ports. More than 4.3 million metric tons of food have since been moved, bound for 29 <coughs> countries across three continents. This includes three vessels chartered by the World Food Program to transport desperately needed food supplies for the people of Afghanistan, the Horn of Africa, and Yemen. A fourth left Istanbul today, and the fifth is on the way. Since the signing of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, global food prices have dropped sharply, although they are still almost 8% higher than a year ago. It is vital that these food shipments continue and increase so commodity markets further stabilize. The United Nations also signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the Russian Federation on the full access of Russian food and fertilizer products including ammonia, to global markets. We are doing everything possible to facilitate these and to ease the serious fertilizer market crunch that is already affecting farming in West Africa and elsewhere. If the fertilizer market is not stabilized, next year could bring a food supply crisis. Simply put, the world may run out of food. It's essential that all states remove every remaining obstacle to the export of Russian fertilizers immediately. We need to get them to farmers at a reasonable cost and onto fields as soon as possible. Another major concern is the impact of high gas prices on the production of nitrogen fertilizers, and these must also be addressed without delay. Madame la Présidente, 
La seule façon de mettre fin aux souffrances en Ukraine, c'est de mettre fin à la guerre. Je continuerai de faire tout mon possible pour la paix, une paix fondée sur le respect du droit international et de la charte des Nations Unies. Et j'appelle tous les États membres, en particulier ceux qui se sont présents ici aujourd'hui, à redoubler d'efforts pour empêcher une nouvelle escalade et à faire tout ce qui est en leur pouvoir pour mettre un terme à la guerre et assurer une paix durable. Je vous remercie. Je donne à présent la parole à Monsieur Karim Khan. Uh, Madam President, uh, Excellencies, uh, Mr. Secretary General, it's a great uh, privilege to have the opportunity to say a few words to this uh, August Council. Uh, this uh, is a moment where we must collectively demonstrate by action, not words, that the law has meaning. It is critical that the law is seen to be on the front line, protecting those most at need. As we speak, in Ukraine and in many other parts of the world, the most vulnerable that deserve our attention, children, women, and men, suffer in agony and insecurity, and the law is looked to for real meaning and for accountability. But this potential that I'm convinced is latent in the law can only work by collective action. It requires determined focus by my office, by the court, but also by all of you. We must demonstrate in every location where violations are alleged and that the court has jurisdiction that in any conflict there are responsibilities. Anybody who picks up a gun, uh, anybody who fires a missile, must realize that the law is alive and not in slumber, and that accountability is absolutely essential. That requires determined action. It requires us to renew our pledge from Nuremberg that there's no statute of limitation for war crimes and to march forward together. And Madam President, I'm convinced that if we coalesce uh, around these basic principles of humanity, these basic norms of conduct, the law can play an ever more impactful role as an anchor for peace and security in Ukraine, but in so many other parts of the world as well. Uh, since the beginning of the recent developments in Ukraine in late February, I have sought uh, to ensure that the response from my office meets the imperatives of action and focus. Uh, in the five days between the 25th of February and the 2nd of March, when I made my initial statement and then opened the investigation, we have moved with some purpose. And the fact that 43 state parties to the Rome Statute, one third of the uh, assembly in total, referred the matter to the court signifies not only the crisis and the concern that is expressed, but also, I believe, an understanding that the law has an important role to play. We're now at the stage of continuing forensic, objective, and impartial, sometimes very painstaking, uh, painstaking work to grapple with the facts, to separate truth from fiction, and to build a picture of what actually happened. Uh, in May, we made the largest field deployment that the ICC has seen. And since May, we have had a permanent field presence uh, in Ukraine. I can announce that next week, further members uh, of my office will also deploy to Ukraine to look in relation to allegations emerging from the east of the country. And building partnerships Embracing innovation takes many forms. New engagements with states, with international organizations, and indeed with the private sector. Hopefully this new model of a more coordinated, more effective partnership, a more coherent approach for action, will render this collective responsibility more effective. But the process of accountability 
uh, of collecting evidence and sieving it and weighing it and determining what is shown uh, is not simply an academic exercise. It is critical in order to pierce the fog of war, to actually present in a juridical forum the truth. And luckily we have independent judges and when we have done our job, we will in due course present matters to the independent judges of the ICC and they will further scrutinize our work very properly and decide where the truth lies. And this exercise is essential if we're to have confidence in the rules-based system. This function and this alone is the focus of my office. It's not a tool of politics. It's not driven by any other agenda than our obligations that are eloquently espoused in the Rome Statute and are underpinned with great eloquence in the Charter of the United Nations that created this august body that I have the privilege to sit in today. Through this work, a picture will emerge. And the picture that I've seen so far is troubling indeed. I have been uh, to Ukraine uh, three times, and one has seen a variety of destruction, of suffering, and harm that forti fortifies my determination and my previous finding that there are reasonable grounds to believe that crimes within the jurisdiction of the court uh, have been committed. Uh, and if I may, Madam President, be quite direct, uh, when I went to Busha and went behind St. Andrew's Church, the bodies I saw were not fake. When I walked the street, streets of Boryadenka, the destruction that I saw of buildings and schools was all too real. Uh, and when I left Kharkiv, the bombs I heard land gave a very somber insight and a very small insight into the awful reality that is faced by many of our brothers and sisters and children that are in a war zone. I am deeply concerned regarding the allegations and the information we are seeing regarding what appeared to be uh, reasonable grounds to believe intentional targeting of civilian objects, uh, and also the transfer of populations from Ukraine outside, particularly children. These are priorities that we are focusing on. But our task collectively is to ensure that those responsible for any crimes that may have been committed, for any uh, decisions that judges of the ICC may make, realize today, in real time, that they're masters of their own destiny. They have the choice and indeed the un, uh, ambiguous responsibilities to act proportionately, to honor the principle of distinction, and to take all means necessary to make sure civilians and civilian objects are not targeted. Uh, justice, as I've said, is not political. Uh, it is a vindication of the fundamental rights of all members of humanity. And it's a demonstration of promises that underpin the Charter and the Rome Statute. And in my view, the echoes of Nuremberg should be heard today. The failure to uphold the promises of Nuremberg that we have seen over the last many decades should act as a reproach on all of us. But leaders, not to despair or to despondency, but act as a catalyst for further action, to regalvanize us as a council, as international organizations, and as humanity, to finally, for goodness sake, to come of age and plag, plant more firmly the flag of legality on the international landscape. So today all I can do is recommit to my obligations and my oath as prosecutor of the ICC to do everything I can to engage with all international partner states, the United Nations, other international organizations, to investigate cases within our jurisdiction in Ukraine and beyond. Uh, the responsibilities that I hold and the much more powerful, much more relevant and much wider responsibilities that you hold demand no less than we meet the challenges of today. 
we must demonstrate the resolve and the determination and the principle in order not to disappoint and fail those that are in most need of the law as we speak. Thank you so much. Je vais maintenant faire une déclaration en ma qualité de ministre de l'Europe et des Affaires étrangères de la France. Monsieur le secrétaire général, monsieur le Premier ministre, mesdames et messieurs les ministres, monsieur le procureur de la Cour pénale internationale, mesdames et messieurs, c'est avec un profond sentiment de gravité que je prends la parole lors de cette réunion du Conseil de sécurité consacrée à l'Ukraine et plus particulièrement aux crimes qui y sont commis. L'agression que la Russie a décidé, seule, de mener contre un État souverain, l'Ukraine, qui n'a eu le tort que de vouloir vivre libre, constitue une violation flagrante des normes fondamentales de notre charte commune, la Charte des Nations Unies. Le non-recours à la force, le règlement pacifique des différents, le respect de la souveraineté des États et de leur intégrité territoriale sont des principes auxquels nous avons tous souscrit autour de la table de ce Conseil. Ils ont été, chacun d'entre eux, ouvertement violés. La guerre qui a débuté le 24 février dernier s'accompagne aussi d'exactions et de destruction d'objectifs civils. Il s'agit d'autant de violations des lois de la guerre et d'autant d'actes dont il faudra rendre compte. À Boucha, à Tcherchniv et dans tant d'autres lieux, des crimes insoutenables ont été perpétrés. La libération d'Izium s'accompagne, elle aussi, de la découverte de nouvelles atrocités commises par les tortionnaires. Alors, le message de la France aujourd'hui est simple. La justice doit être notre impératif commun. Il n'y aura pas de paix sans justice. La justice est bien sûr un impératif pour les victimes qui ont droit à la reconnaissance et à la réparation de leurs souffrances. Toutes les souffrances de chaque victime. La justice est ensuite un impératif de sécurité internationale. Et je le dis à ceux qui ne voient dans cette guerre qu'un simple conflit de plus. Si tout est permis ici, tout le sera davantage ailleurs. Et la possibilité d'une guerre d'agression ne fera que croître. La justice, enfin, est un impératif politique. Nous aurons, il le faudra, nous assurer que des individus rendent compte des crimes dont ils sont responsables, qu'ils les aient commis, ordonnés ou planifiés. Mais c'est l'idée même que soit possible de tels crimes, de telles atteintes à notre humanité commune, qui doit être combattue en parole et en acte. Pour cela, un cadre a été posé, celui d'une justice professionnelle et spécialisée. À son sommet, la Cour pénale internationale a été saisie par... 43 États, dont la France. C'est la première fois qu'autant d'États réfèrent une situation à la Cour, signe de l'importance que nous attachons collectivement à ce qui se joue ici. La Cour elle-même agira, vous le savez, en complémentarité avec la justice ukrainienne, ainsi qu'avec les autres juridictions nationales saisies, au nombre desquelles les juridictions françaises et celles de plusieurs États aujourd'hui présents. Dans ce cadre, la justice doit passer. La France travaille donc avec de nombreux autres partenaires à renforcer dans l'ensemble de ces juridictions la collecte de preuves et le recueil d'informations fiables. C'est pourquoi la France a agi très concrètement. Dès que les informations sur les crimes commis à Boucha ont été connues au mois d'avril dernier, nous avons dépêché en Ukraine deux équipes d'enquêteurs. Ils ont, pendant trois mois, aider la justice ukrainienne à établir minutieusement et patiemment les faits. Puis nous avons fait don d'un laboratoire mobile d'analyse ADN. Maintenant qu'à Izium, de nouvelles atrocités ont été révélées à la face du monde, nous venons de décider d'envoyer une nouvelle mission d'appui aux enquêteurs sur place. Car là où la Russie agit par la désinformation et la propagande, la justice, elle, doit s'appuyer sur des faits. Notre soutien s'étend bien évidemment à la Cour pénale internationale. Il est à la fois financier et humain par la mise à disposition de magistrats et d'enquêteurs à son bénéfice, dans le plus grand respect de son indépendance. Notre soutien, enfin, 
s'étend à l'ensemble des juridictions qui doivent pouvoir facilement coopérer entre elles. Ainsi, le règlement d'Eurojust a-t-il été modifié sous présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne pour permettre à la Cour pénale internationale de participer aux équipes communes d'enquête réunissant plusieurs juridictions nationales, dont celle de l'Ukraine. Ce que nous faisons a du sens. Il s'agit de la lutte contre l'impunité, mais il s'agit aussi de l'intégrité de notre ordre international. Le choix de la guerre par la Russie sous de faux prétextes, sa manipulation grossière d'une notion aussi lourde que celle de génocide, qui constitue le crime des crimes, celui qui a justifié, après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, qu'avance le projet d'une justice pénale internationale, interpelle profondément. La Cour internationale de justice elle-même a relevé le caractère abusif de cette fausse affirmation. La même manipulation est à l'œuvre lorsqu'on parle de référendum dans des territoires conquis par la force et soumis à la terreur, ou lorsque certains nous menacent de tous les moyens, alors que nous sommes, avec d'autres, ceux qui refusons de participer à quelque escalade que ce soit. Face à ceux qui privent les mots de leur sens, notre mission, notre devoir, notre travail autour de la table de ce Conseil est aussi de rendre aux choses leur sens. Et je voudrais pour conclure citer un auteur russe. Nous devons condamner publiquement l'idée même que des hommes puissent exercer pareille violence sur d'autres hommes. En taisant le vice, en l'enfouissant dans notre corps pour qu'il ne ressorte pas à l'extérieur, nous le semons. Et dans l'avenir, il n'en donnera que mille fois plus de pouces. En écrivant ces lignes, Solzhenitsyn se référait aux décennies de crimes commis par l'URSS sur son propre territoire. Hélas, il n'y a pas un mot à en retrancher pour décrire les crimes commis aujourd'hui par la Russie hors de ses frontières. La Cour enquête sur des faits pouvant être, selon son procureur, constitutifs de crimes de guerre et de crimes contre l'humanité. Nous verrons ces conclusions. Mais dès aujourd'hui, nous pouvons et devons dire que leurs responsables seront identifiés, poursuivis et in fine jugés. Le temps peut paraître long pour les victimes et leurs familles, mais elles doivent avoir la certitude qu'ils ne resteront pas impunis. Nous le leur devons. Et il n'en va pas seulement de ce que nous leur devons, il en va de notre sécurité et il en va aussi des principes universels qui nous lient. Je vous remercie. Et je reprends mes fonctions de présidente du Conseil et donne la parole à son Excellence Monsieur Jonas Gahr Premier ministre de la Norvège. Madame la Présidente, je vous remercie. Secretary General and Prosecutor uh, Karim Khan, thank you for your briefings. This week here at the United Nations, I believe we have seen how we as a global community face dire challenges from war, climate change, energy shortage, food insecurity and inequality. And we see how it is ordinary people who pay the heaviest price. Against this background, I believe it's our responsibility as members of the United Nations and in particular we 15 around this table to chart a different path one of hope and belief in what we can achieve together for our citizens and for humanity. The Secretary General underlined this eloquently in his address on Tuesday. And yet again today, we have the values and principles necessary to chart that course, and they are all enshrined in the Charter of the United Nations. Madam President, the Charter sets out clear principles for a rules-based international order, and sadly, this order is under attack. Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine constitutes a gross violation of international law, including the UN Charter, a violation of the core principle on which this organization is built, the sovereign equality of all its people and members. Madam President, I listened carefully to President Putin's speech yesterday, announcing a major escalation of this war, explained by a long list of allegations that Russia is being threatened from the West. Madam President, speaking for Norway, an elected member of this Council, a European state, a NATO member, 
and a neighbor to Russia, let me say as clearly as I can. These allegations are simply not true. There is no military threat against Russia. There is no legitimate reason whatsoever to underpin a massive mobilization of Russian troops. This escalation will only lead to increased suffering for Ukrainians and Russians alike. Russia must abide by the order of the International Court of Justice and immediately suspend its military operations in the territory of Ukraine. Russia chose to start this war. It must now choose to stop it. None of the differences there may be between Russia and Ukraine can be solved by the ongoing military onslaught. So, Madam President, this General Assembly of the United Nations has reminded us of the global consequences of this war. Surging energy prices and increasing food insecurity are exacerbating the suffering of those who are most vulnerable. Not to mention the potential effects of a nuclear accident in Ukraine, which could have far-reaching consequences. The presence of Russian forces at the Saporizhia nuclear power plant severely compromises nuclear safety and security. We commend the IEA for its efforts in helping to stabilize the situation. But Russia's behavior is also hurting multilateral cooperation at a time when we need it more than ever. The Black Sea Grain Initiative is an important step to bring Ukrainian foodstuff back to the world market. As the Secretary General has said, it's multilateral diplomacy in action, and we commend his efforts to facilitate this initiative. Norway also expresses its full support for the Secretary General's goods offices. When the time comes, and it must come, we will stand firmly with the UN in the efforts to build and sustain peace. Madam President, in Ukraine, thousands of civilians, including children, have been killed. Millions have fled their countries, often separated from their loved ones. Many thousands have been welcomed in my country. May the day come, sooner rather than later, when they can return home safely to rebuild their country. The recent escalation of attacks on civilian targets is utterly unacceptable. Russia's indiscriminate use of heavy explosive weapons in destroying homes, schools and hospitals. Unspeakable horrors were revealed in Butsha in March and now in Itzium and other places previously under occupation. Civilians have forcibly been transferred to Russia and Russian occupied territory. And there are disturbing reports of sexual violence being used as a tactic of war. This must be condemned in the strongest possible terms. Madam President, we also condemn the planned so-called referendums in the occupied regions of Ukraine. They would be contrary to international law, they would be a clear breach of the UN Charter, and they would have no legal standing and no legitimacy. They would in no way affect Ukraine's sovereignty within its international recognized borders. Let that be clear. Madam President, international law is not optional, and as the prosecutor said, justice is not political. All reports of atrocities and human rights violations must be properly investigated and those responsible brought to justice. Norway has supported this effort and will continue to do so. There can be no impunity, as Madam President so accurately said. Accountability is key, but to ensure justice for the victims and to deter future, both to ensure justice for the victims and to deter future violations. Perpetrators must be held to account through national or international criminal justice mechanisms. This is why we welcome the Commission of Inquiry on Ukraine established by the Human Rights Council, and Norway continues to fully support the International Criminal Court. The ICC's mission is crucial, both in the context of Ukraine and globally. Madam President, let me end on this note. This war is a catastrophe for Ukraine and its people. Its ramifications have serious consequences for vulnerable people and communities all around the world. But let me say this, it is also detrimental to Russia itself, our neighbor. Thousands of Russian soldiers have been sent to their deaths in unnecessary and illegal war. Russian citizens are increasingly being denied human rights and fundamental freedoms in a society ruled with an even stronger authoritarian fist. If the Russian people and we know them, could freely express their views, would they have chosen war? I doubt it. 
So, Madam President, democracy, rule of law, and human rights are essential. They are our best tools for promoting peace between states and accountability at all levels. They are also what we have to build on when we turn our back on war and destruction. We must defend these norms and standards and the values that underpin them. And again, the core principles are enshrined in the Charter. Preventing and ending acts of aggression is a direct responsibility of the Security Council, and Norway will continue to use the remaining part of its elected period here to promote dialogue and a peaceful settlement and fair resolution to this meaningful, meaningless war. But we will also, Madam President, stand up for Ukraine's right to defend itself against onslaught and aggression, as we will defend our right to support Ukraine in its self-defense. We will speak up for international law, for the values of the United Nations, and take action for all people in need who are affected by this war, no matter where they are. Because this war of aggression is an attack not just against Ukraine, but also against the principles and values of the UN Charter. The Ukrainian people are giving their lives to defend these universal values and their own independence. And Ukraine can count on Norway's continued support in this struggle. Merci, Madame la Présidente. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Stör de sa déclaration et je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Marcello Ebrar Casabon, secrétaire des relations extérieures du Mexique. Merci Madame Président. Uh, agradezco al Secretario General Antonio Guterres y al Fiscal de la Corte Penal Internacional Karim Khan por sus valiosas uh, presentaciones. Reconozco la presencia en esta sesión del Consejo de Seguridad del Primer Ministro de Noruega, así como de otros colegas, ministras, ministros, representantes de alto nivel. Es de agradecerse también a Francia y a usted, señora ministra, por haber convocado a este debate sobre un flagrante quebrantamiento a lo establecido en la Carta de las Naciones Unidas que ha violentado la paz y la seguridad internacionales. A siete meses del inicio de la guerra en Ucrania, sus múltiples implicaciones sociales, económicas y políticas son evidentes. Como en todo conflicto armado, el mayor costo lo ha pagado la sociedad civil. Esta guerra ha generado desplazamientos masivos de personas, tanto al interior de Ucrania como hacia países vecinos, sobre todo de mujeres y niños. Los daños materiales registrados son también graves y onerosos. Desde el inicio de las hostilidades, México ha insistido en buscar una solución diplomática y en atender la dimensión humanitaria del conflicto, sin subordinar las consideraciones políticas en estricto apego al derecho internacional humanitario. En este Consejo impulsamos, junto con Francia, un proyecto de resolución en ese sentido que se tornó a la Asamblea General y dio lugar a la resolución E11-2, adoptada el pasado 24 de marzo, Hoy reiteramos que la asistencia humanitaria sigue siendo ineludible y prioritaria. Hemos procurado también, en la medida de nuestras posibilidades, apoyar las gestiones de mediación del secretario general y formulamos junto con Noruega una declaración presidencial con tal propósito, la cual se adoptó el pasado 6 de mayo. Es una declaración a todas luces insuficiente, pero la única expresión pública que este Consejo ha sido capaz de emitir desde el inicio del conflicto. El avance de la guerra con sus cuantiosos costos humanos y materiales y el incremento de las necesidades humanitarias derivadas del conflicto, tales como la insuficiencia humanitaria y el alto costo de los combustibles de cara al invierno, requiere con urgencia de una solución por la vía diplomática de un alto al fuego. Para ello se requiere voluntad política de las partes y compromiso de la comunidad internacional. Conviene insistir entonces en la necesidad de respetar el derecho internacional, el derecho internacional humanitario, el derecho internacional de los derechos humanos. La rendición de cuentas también es otro pilar fundamental del sistema multilateral, del Estado de Derecho y de la Paz. Por ello, sin pretextos ni condiciones, los responsables de los crímenes que se hayan cometido en Ucrania deben ser llevados ante la justicia. En ese sentido, es fundamental el trabajo de la Corte Penal Internacional para investigar las denuncias presentadas 
sobre presuntos crímenes de guerra y de lesa humanidad. Seguiremos con la mayor atención los avances de dichas investigaciones. Es señaladamente preocupante la dimensión del riesgo nuclear derivada de los enfrentamientos alrededor de la planta nuclear de Zaporizhia. Asegurar su integridad y buen funcionamiento es crítico para evitar la peor de las catástrofes posibles. Respaldamos las recomendaciones formuladas por el Organismo Internacional de Energía Atómica tras su inspección técnica, las cuales deben ser acatadas de inmediato y apoyamos los llamados para crear un perímetro de seguridad alrededor de la planta. Finalmente, reconocemos el valor que representa la firma de la iniciativa de Granos del Mar Negro. Los índices de la FAO muestran que los precios de los granos en los últimos dos meses han empezado a disminuir. Es una muestra del valor que tiene la diplomacia. Aún en medio de la guerra, el diálogo y los acuerdos son posibles. Esta es fundamental también poder garantizar el acceso de los fertilizantes a los mercados globales y nos alienta a saber que se han dado ya pasos concretos en esa dirección. Reconocemos ampliamente el liderazgo que ha tenido el secretario general de la ONU, así como el presidente de Turquía en la gestión de los acuerdos suscritos. Señora Presidenta, desde el inicio del conflicto, la posición de mi país se ha sustentado en nuestros principios constitucionales de política exterior, los cuales están en consonancia con los principios y propósitos de la Carta de las Naciones Unidas. Señaladamente, la no intervención, la solución pacífica de las controversias y la proscripción de la amenaza o el uso de la fuerza. No hay espacio para la ambigüedad. La coexistencia pacífica de los estados depende precisamente del respeto de todos ellos. No puede haber excepciones. En estos meses hemos sido claros al reiterar la importancia del artículo 2 de la Carta de la ONU relativo a la proscripción del uso de la fuerza contra la integridad territorial e independencia política de cualquier estado. Por experiencia propia, México conoce y entiende bien la importancia de contar con la garantía básica de poder vivir sin la amenaza de ser invadido por otro país. Cualquier acción que violente ese principio es ilegal y es ilegítima. El, es propósito de esta organización y mandato de este Consejo prevenir que las personas sufran de los flagelos de la guerra. Pero esto solo puede lograrse mediante el diálogo, la diplomacia y la construcción de canales políticos efectivos. No es admisible la indiferencia, como tampoco, tampoco lo es quedarse en el lamento de que hasta ahora en el caso que nos ocupa, el Consejo de Seguridad no haya sido capaz de cumplir con su responsabilidad esencial. Las causas por las que este Consejo se puede volver disfuncional son conocidas. Corregirlas depende de nosotros. Los tiempos son propicios para plantear con toda seriedad las reformas estructurales que se requieren para ello. Señora Presidenta, sus excelencias, con base en su vocación pacifista, México considera que la comunidad internacional debe canalizar ahora sus mejores esfuerzos para alcanzar la paz. En tal sentido es que me permito compartir la propuesta del presidente de México, Andrés Manuel López Obrador, para fortalecer los esfuerzos de mediación del secretario general, Antonio Guterres, mediante la formación de un comité para el diálogo y la paz en Ucrania, con la participación de otros jefes de Estado y de gobierno, incluidos de ser posible su excelencia Narendra Modi de la India y su santidad el Papa Francisco. El objetivo sería muy claro, generar nuevos mecanismos para el diálogo y crear espacios complementarios para la mediación que fomenten la confianza, reduzcan las tensiones y abran el camino hacia una paz duradera. La Delegación de México proseguirá con las consultas necesarias con el único propósito de poder contribuir como un actor imparcial y de buena fe para generar un amplio respaldo a las gestiones de mediación que encabeza el Secretario General, así como el comité mencionado, cuya conformación esperamos proceda con el respaldo de los Estados miembros de la ONU que así lo decidan. Como lo ha dicho el señor Secretario General, es tiempo de actuar, comprometerse con la paz. Resignarse a la guerra es siempre ir al precipicio. Muchas gracias. Je remercie son excellence monsieur Ebrard Casarbon et je donne la parole a son excellence monsieur Anthony Blinken, secrétaire d'État des États-Unis d'Amérique. Merci beaucoup madame la présidente d'avoir réuni ce conseil en ce moment grave sur la crise créée par la Russie 
en Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Secretary General, thank you for your determination and the moral clarity that you've brought to ending this brutal war and defending the UN's core principles, and also for your personal engagement in securing the vital Black Sea route for grain to flow once again from Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Khan, we're grateful uh, for the efforts of the Office of the Prosecutor to investigate objectively and professionally the atrocities being committed in Ukraine by Russian forces and for its support for and coordination with Ukrainian investigators and prosecutors. We hear a lot about the divisions among countries at the United Nations. But recently, what is striking is the remarkable unity among member states when it comes to Russia's war on Ukraine. Leaders from countries developing and developed, big and small, north and south, have spoken in the General Assembly about the consequences of this war and the need to end it. And they've called on all of us to reaffirm our commitment to the UN Charter and its core principles, including sovereignty, territorial integrity, human rights. Even a number of nations that maintain close ties with Moscow have said publicly that they have serious questions and concerns about President Putin's ongoing invasion. Rather than change course, however, President Putin has doubled down, choosing not to end the war, but to expand it, not to pull troops back, but to call 300,000 additional troops up, not to ease tensions, but to escalate them through the threat of nuclear weapons, not to work toward a diplomatic solution, but to render such a solution impossible by seeking to annex more Ukrainian territory through sham referenda. That President Putin picked this week, as most of the world gathers at the United Nations, to add fuel to the fire that he started shows his utter contempt for the UN Charter, for the General Assembly, and for this Council. The very international order that we have gathered here to uphold is being shredded before our eyes. We cannot, we will not allow President Putin to get away with it. Defending Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity is about much more than standing up for one nation's right to choose its own path. Fundamental as that right is. It's also about protecting an international order where no nation can redraw the borders of another by force. If we fail to defend this principle when the Kremlin is so flagrantly violating it, we send a message to aggressors everywhere that they can ignore it too. We put every country at risk. We open the door to a less secure, a less peaceful world. We see what that world looks like in the parts of Ukraine controlled by Russian forces. Wherever the Russian tide recedes, we discover the horror that's left in its wake. I had a window into that horror myself when I traveled to Irpin just a few weeks ago to meet with the Ukrainian investigators who were compiling evidence of war crimes committed there. I saw up close the gaping holes left in residential buildings by Russian shelling, indiscriminate at best, intentional at worst. As we assemble here, Ukrainian and international investigators continue to exhume bodies outside of Izium, a city Russian forces controlled for six months before they were driven out by Ukrainian counteroffensive. One site contains some 440 unmarked graves. A number of the bodies unearthed there so far reportedly show signs of torture, including one victim with broken arms and a rope around his neck. Survivors' accounts are also emerging, including a man who described being tortured by Russian forces for a dozen days, during which his interrogators repeatedly electrocuted him and, in his words, and I quote, beat me to the point where I didn't feel anything, end quote. These are not the acts of rogue units. They fit a clear pattern across the territory controlled by Russian forces. This is one of the many reasons that we support a range of national and international efforts to collect and examine the mounting evidence of war crimes in Ukraine. We must hold the perpetrators accountable for these crimes. It's also one of the reasons why more than 40 nations have come together to help the Ukrainian people defend themselves 
a right that is enshrined in Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. The more setbacks Russian forces endure on the battlefield, the greater the pain they are inflicting on Ukrainian civilians. Russian attacks on dams, on bridges, on power stations, on hospitals, on other civilian infrastructure are increasing, constituting a brazen violation of international humanitarian law. This week, President Putin said that Russia would not hesitate to use, and I quote, all weapon systems available, end quote, in response to a threat to its territorial integrity, a threat that is all the more menacing given Russians' intention to annex large swaths of Ukraine in the days ahead. When that's complete, we can expect President Putin will claim any Ukrainian effort to liberate this land as an attack on so-called Russian territory. This from a country that in January of this year, in this place, joined other permanent members of the Security Council in signing a statement affirming that, and I quote, nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. Yet another example of how Russia violates the commitments it's made before this body, and yet another reason why nobody should take Russia at its word today. Every council member should send a clear message that these reckless nuclear threats must stop immediately. Russia's effort to annex more Ukrainian territory is another dangerous escalation, as well as a repudiation of diplomacy. It is even more alarming when coupled with the filtration operation that Russian forces have been carrying out across parts of Ukraine that they control. Now, this is a diabolical strategy, violently uprooting thousands of Ukrainians, bus in Russians to replace them, call a vote, manipulate the results to show near unanimous support for joining the Russian Federation. This is right out of the Crimea playbook. As with Crimea, it's imperative that every member of this council, and for that matter, every member of the United Nations, reject the sham referenda and unequivocally declare that all Ukrainian territory is and will remain part of Ukraine. And no Russian claim to annex territory can take away Ukraine's right to defend its own land. Putin's invasion is also distracting this council, in fact, the entire UN system, from working on the serious issues that we all want to focus on, like preventing a climate catastrophe, aiding tens of millions of people on the brink of famine, fulfilling the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, shoring up our interconnected health security, all issues that make a tangible difference in the lives of the citizens that we are here to represent and that they are looking to us, looking to us to deliver on. The overwhelming majority of UN member states are committed to working together on these issues and our actions show that. Yet, while more than 100 countries have signed on to a roadmap to provide food aid to those who need it, and partners across Africa, Asia, the Americas, and Europe are working together to increase the resilience of global food systems, Russia for months blocked the export of Ukrainian grain to the world until the United Nations and Turkey secured a deal to let the grain go. And Russia continues to bomb and seize Ukrainian farms and silos, line its wheat fields with landmines, raising the cost of food for people everywhere. And while governments around the world are teaming up with international organizations, with the private sector, with philanthropies, to end this pandemic and make sure that we're better prepared for the next one, Russia is spreading misinformation and disinformation about WHO-approved vaccines, fueling vaccine hesitancy that puts people in all our countries at greater risk. Here is the reality. None of us chose this war, not the Ukrainians who knew the crushing toll it would take. Not the United States, which warned that it was coming and worked to prevent it. Not the vast majority of countries at the United Nations. And neither did our people or the people of virtually every UN member state who are feeling the war's consequences in greater food insecurity and higher energy prices. Nor did the Russian mothers and fathers whose children are being sent off to fight and die in this war. Or the Russian citizens 
who continue to risk their freedom to protest against it, including those who came out into the streets of Moscow after President Putin announced his mobilization to chant, let our children live. Indeed, it must be asked, how has this aggression against Ukraine by President Putin improved the lives or prospects of a single Russian citizen? One man chose this war, one man can end it. Because if Russia stops fighting, the war ends. If Ukraine stops fighting, Ukraine ends. That's why we will continue to support Ukraine as it defends itself and strengthen its hand to achieve a diplomatic solution on just terms at a negotiating table. As President Zelensky has said repeatedly, diplomacy is the only way to end this war. But diplomacy cannot and must not be used as a cudgel to impose on Ukraine a settlement that cuts against the UN Charter or rewards Russia for violating it. President Putin is making his choice. Now, it's up to all of our countries to make ours. Tell President Putin to stop the horror that he started. Tell him to stop putting his interests above the interests of the rest of the world, including his own people. Tell him to stop debasing this council and everything it stands for. We, the people of the United Nations, determined. That is how the preamble of the UN Charter starts. Let's not forget that we, the peoples, still get to choose the fate of this institution and our world. The stakes are clear. The choice is ours. Let's make the right choice for the world that we want and that our people so desperately deserve. Thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Blinken de sa déclaration et je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Wang Yi, conseiller d'État et ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Chine.主席女士我感谢库隆纳尔拜长女士召集今天的部长级的会议我也感谢古德雷斯秘书长所做的通报中国在乌克兰问题上的立场是一贯的也是明确的习近平主席指出各国的主权领土安整联合国宪章的宗旨和原则都应该得到遵守各国的合理安全关切都应该得到遵守一切有利于解决危机的努力都应该得到支持中方高度重视乌克兰人道局势累计向乌方援助了三千五百万元人民币的人道物资今天以来
要遵守国际人道法，杜绝针对平民和民用设施的袭击，最大限度减少平民的伤亡。对违反国际人道法的行为进行调查，应当客观公正，以事实为基础，不搞有罪推定，避免政治化。国际社会要支持联合国人道救援机构，秉持中立。公正原则，继续为乌克兰以及周边国家受影响的民众提供帮助。第四，必须全力遏制外溢的影响。能源供应国和消费国应当共同努力，确保全球能源市场稳定运行。我们支持古德斯秘书长推动解决。俄罗斯和乌克兰粮食的外溢问题，中方提出了国际粮食安全合作倡议，欢迎各方积极响应。各国都不应该滥施单边制裁，更不能让发展中国家为此买单。主席女士，安理会作为国际集体安全机制的核心，在乌克兰问题上应当秉持客观公正的基本原则。遵循止战、促谈的正确方向，优先运用斡旋工具进行调解。我们要共同汇集和平和解的正能量，采取建设性、负责任的行动，推动政治解决进程。乌克兰危机和国际形势紧密相连，越是面对挑战，越要保持团结，开展合作。我们要齐心协力，维护以联合国为中心的国际体系，恪守以联合国宪章宗旨、原则为基础的国际关系基本准则，照顾各方的合理正当关切，摒弃霸权主义和强权逻辑，防止任何形式的热战和所谓的新冷战，坚持共同、综合、合作、可持续的。安全观，求同存异，互谅互让，为重建欧洲安全和世界和平而做出不懈的努力。以上就是中方的发言，谢谢。Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Wang de sa déclaration. Et je donne la parole à Son Excellence Madame Olta Jashka, ministre de l'Europe et des Affaires étrangères de l'Albanie. Madame Présidente, I join other colleagues to thank France for convening today's briefing and Minister Colonna for chairing it. This issue has been without interruption on the agenda of the Council, but this meeting could not be timelier given the latest escalatory declarations by Kremlin. I also welcome the decision of the French Presidency of the Council to continue keeping the focus on accountability, an issue of the utmost importance uh, that we initiated together back in April with the ARIA Formula meeting that Albania and France organized jointly. I also thank ICC Prosecutor General Khan for his information and his tireless efforts to establish accountability in Ukraine. Madam President, The Russian Federation, a permanent member of the Security Council, has waged an illegal war of aggression against Ukraine. In our judgment and in the eyes of the entire world, as clearly expressed more than once here in the United Nations, Russia's actions are a blatant violation of the Charter of the United Nations. Let's not forget that the highest international justice body, the International Court of Justice, has ordered Russia to suspend its military operation in Ukraine. International law is the same and mandatory for all. Russia has unfortunately chosen to openly and continuously ignore it. The very principle and belief upon which the UN was founded was that the only way to prevent war was through universal norms and laws accepted by all in the, post, in the new post-World War II order. In the decades since, despite the challenges and difficulties, We have all managed to strengthen and expand the reach of international law and multilateral cooperation 
and we have agreed that no one can stand above the law. We had hoped that the world would never again go back to the distant past, but the war in Ukraine and Russia's flagrant attempt to conquer and annex parts of Ukraine's territory are actions reminiscent of the dark days of fascism and Stalinism. And there is much more in what is happening in Ukraine today that is reminiscent of those dark days. Reports and fact-finding missions from the ground, footage the whole world has seen reveal a basic truth about Russia's actions, an appalling criminal brutality against the civilian population. Innocent men, women, and children in Ukraine, as well as tens of thousands of Russian soldiers have paid with their lives for Vladimir Putin's war, war of choice. Millions around the world are going hungry because of Vladimir Putin's uh, war of choice. We condemn Russia's new path of confrontation by announcing a partial mobilization in Russia, by supporting the organization of illegal referenda in four Ukrainian territories currently occupied, and by threatening again with the use of weapons of mass destruction. These sham referenda are another blatant violation of the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine and a serious violation of the UN Charter. We reiterate our one unwavering support for Ukraine's independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity, and reiterate our call for Russia to completely and unconditionally withdraw all of its troops and military equipment from the entire territory of Ukraine uh, within its internationally recognized borders. This is why we must galvanize our forces and continue to help Ukraine defend itself. But that is why, too, we must work to guarantee full accountability for what Russia is doing in Ukraine. It is to provide justice, but this is also to prevent future atrocities. We all tried to prevent this conflict. We could not. But we must not fail to hold Russia accountable. Thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence Madame Jashkap de sa déclaration et je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Simon Coveney, ministre des Affaires étrangères et de la Défense de l'Irlande. Thank you, Madam President, uh, Secretary General Guterres. Uh, one week ago, I stood on the deck of a cargo ship in the port of Odessa, watching 46,000 tons of grain being loaded bound for Bangladesh. That same day, the total amount of grain exported from Ukrainian ports through the Black Sea Grain Initiative had reached 3 million tons. Ukrainian and UN staff in Odessa spoke to me of their plans to reach 4 million tons of grain per month. Secretary General, as you have said so eloquently, those ships carry not just grain, but the rare commodity of hope. And they represent something else too, the power of multilateralism. In the midst of conflict, the UN and the government of Turkey negotiated a deal to get desperately needed grain out of Ukraine and onto world markets. This happened through dialogue, through using the systems and structures the norms and institutions that we have painstakingly built over decades to resolve differences, to find solutions, and to deliver for our citizens. These are the principles and institutions that we, all of us around this table, have a solemn commitment to uphold. Madam President, let me recall another moment of hope. In January of this year, the leaders of the five nuclear weapons states, including Russia, declared that a nuclear war cannot be won and can never be fought. Those five leaders, including President Putin, committed to avoid military confrontations, strengthen stability and predictability, increase mutual understanding and confidence, and pursue constructive dialogue with mutual respect. Just six weeks later, Russia launched an unwarranted and illegal further invasion of Ukraine. 
of another sovereign UN member state, of a neighbour. And now, this week, President Putin again issues threats to use nuclear weapons. Let us be absolutely clear. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the antithesis of the principles of the UN Charter. It is a grave violation of international law. It's an attempt to change internationally recognized borders by use of force. And no sham referendums can change that basic fact. It cannot be allowed to stand. If we, failed, if we fail to hold Russia accountable, we send a signal to large, powerful countries that they can prey on their neighbors with impunity which is something that every nation on earth should take note of. This is why Ireland yesterday filed a declaration of intervention at the International Court of Justice in Ukraine's case against Russia. It is why we are intervening in Ukraine's case against Russia at the European Court of Human Rights. It is why we have supported action at the OSCE, the Council of Europe, the UN General Assembly and the Human Rights Council to hold Russia accountable for what it's doing. It's why, with 42 other state parties of the International Criminal Court, we referred the situation in Ukraine to the ICC prosecutor who's with us here today. It is why we support Ukraine's efforts to establish a compensation and reparations mechanism. And it's why we will work with Ukraine and other partners to examine how we can hold Russia accountable for the crime of aggression. But it is also why this Council collectively must consider how it acts to protect the principles and purpose of the UN Charter itself. No one country, no matter how big or powerful, should have the ability to veto the application of international law for its own aims. Madam President, I said at this Council in April that without accountability, there is no hope for a sustainable peace, not in Ukraine, not anywhere. And I repeat that today. I also recall here in April the shocking evidence I saw in Bucha of Russian forces' disregard for international humanitarian law. That was no fabrication. The bodies that I saw tell a story. Five months later, more mass graves are being discovered in Izium and in other areas that were until recently under Russian occupation. Attacks by Russian for forces on civilians and civilian infrastructure have intensified further since then. The devastating impact of explosive weapons in populated areas is ever more evident, with tens of thousands of homes hospitals and schools destroyed. This is why Ireland is seeking the wide endorsement by states of the political declaration on explosive weapons in populated areas at a high-level adoption conference in Dublin in November. Madam President, millions of civilians in Ukraine and beyond are being potentially put at risk by Russia's occupation of the Zaboritsa nuclear power plant. I want to repeat the demand of last week's IAEA Board of Governors. Russia must immediately cease all actions against the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. Ukrainian authorities must regain full control. The last thing the world needs now is a nuclear accident. Madam President, this conflict can and will end. Our collective responsibility to the UN Charter, to the Pacific settlement of disputes, to the maintenance of international peace and security demands that it ends sooner rather than later. The path to peace is clear. The country that made a deliberate decision to start this conflict must now make the decision to bring it to an end. Russia must withdraw its forces from the sovereign territory of a fellow UN member state. It must be held accountable for its actions through the international bodies and structures that we together have created for this purpose. 
it is not solely about Ukraine and its future. This is about the entirety of the UN membership, all of us and all of our countries. If we do not reject Russia's actions in the clearest and most stark terms, we allow the world to be governed by force and not through dialogue and the application of international law. Madam President, this Council must take the lead. Son Excellence Monsieur Kovny de sa déclaration, et je donne la parole à Son Excellence le Dr Subramaniam Jai Shankar, Ministre des Affaires étrangères de l'Inde. Thank you, Madam President. Let me begin by congratulating the French Presidency for its able stewardship of the Security Council this month. I also thank Secretary General Antonio Guterres for his briefing and take note of the remarks made by ICC Prosecutor Karim Khan. Allow me, Madam President, to preface my remarks by reminding the Council that India is not a signatory to the Rome Statute nor a member of the International Criminal Court. Madam President, the trajectory of the Ukraine conflict is a matter of profound concern for the entire international community. The future outlook appears even more disturbing. The nuclear issue is a particular anxiety. In a globalized world, the impact of the conflict is being felt even in distant regions. We have all experienced its consequences in terms of surging costs and actual shortages of food grains, fertilizers, and fuel. On this core, too, there are good grounds to be worried about what awaits us. The global south, especially, is feeling the pain very acutely. We must, therefore, not initiate measures that further complicates the struggling global economy. And that is why India strongly reiterates the need for an immediate cessation of all hostilities and a return to dialogue and diplomacy. Clearly, as Prime Minister Narendra Modi has emphasized, this cannot be an era of war. On our part, we are also providing both humanitarian assistance to Ukraine and economic support to some of our neighbors under economic stress. Turning to the specific topic before the Council today, let me emphasize that even in conflict situations, there can be no justification for violation of human rights or of international law. Where any such acts occur, it is imperative that they are investigated in an objective and independent manner. This was the position we took with regard to the killings in Bucha, and this is the position we take even today. The Council will also recall that we had then supported calls for an independent investigation into the Bucha incident. The fight against impunity is critical to the larger pursuit of securing peace and justice. The Security Council must send an unambiguous and unequivocal message on this count. Politics should never, ever provide cover to evade accountability, nor indeed to facilitate impunity. Regrettably, we have seen this of late in this very chamber when it comes to sanctioning of some of the world's most dreaded terrorists. If egregious attacks committed in broad daylight are left unpunished, this Council must reflect on the signals we are sending on impunity. There must be consistency if we are to ensure credibility. Once again, let me emphasize, Madam President, that the need of the hour is to end this conflict in Ukraine and return to the negotiating table. This Council is the most powerful contemporary symbol of diplomacy. It must continue to live up to its purpose. The global order that we all subscribe to is based on international law, UN Charter, and respect for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of all states. These principles, too, must be upheld without exception. I thank you, Madam President. 
Je remercie Son Excellence le Dr Jashankar de sa déclaration. Et je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Michael Moussa Adamo, ministre des Affaires étrangères du Gabon. Je vous remercie, Madame la Présidente. Madame la Présidente, je vous remercie pour l'initiative de cette réunion sur la situation en Ukraine qui intervient parallèlement à la semaine de haut niveau de l'Assemblée générale, placée sous le sceau de la hardiesse des solutions à un moment où le monde se trouve à un tournant décisif. Je remercie le secrétaire général pour l'état des lieux sur la situation en Ukraine, ainsi que le procureur de la Cour pénale internationale, M. Karim Khan, pour son exposé. Madame la Présidente, l'humanité perd ses repères chaque fois qu'elle s'enlise dans la belligérance et échoue à protéger les civils des atrocités et de l'aurore. La guerre en Ukraine nous interpelle à plusieurs égards. Elle nous interpelle sur les victimes qui se comptent en milliers, sur les ruines des dévastations et la détresse des victimes meurtries. Elle nous interpelle sur la propagande, la désinformation ou la propension à la réécriture de la réalité. Elle nous interpelle sur la menace nucléaire et ses conséquences potentiellement irréparables. Elle nous interpelle aussi pour son nombre de, cho de chocs sur la sécurité alimentaire à l'échelle mondiale. Face à cette avalanche d'interpellation, les peuples du monde ont les yeux rivés vers ce Conseil pour une réponse aux défis multidimensionnels qui se dressent sur la trajectoire de leurs aspirations pour la paix et la sécurité internationale. Aux femmes, hommes et aux enfants qui redoutent une catastrophe nucléaire et se demandent à quand la fin de la guerre en Ukraine, nous devons une réponse. Et notre réaction, Madame le Président, ne peut pas être un affrontement d'invective. Nous devons être à la hauteur du mandat qui nous est assigné par la Charte des Nations Unies et de la confiance que les peuples du monde ont placée en cette organisation. Le Gabon, mon pays, milite pour un dialogue constructif afin de, taire, de faire taire les armes. Nous sommes contre la guerre, contre les discours de haine contre la rhétorique outrancière qui attise la belligérance et compromet les perspectives de paix. Madame la Présidente, mon pays note avec intérêt l'ouverture par la Cour pénale internationale d'enquête sur les crimes commis par toutes les parties dans la guerre en Ukraine en vue de collecter des éléments de preuve et pouvoir établir les faits ainsi que les responsabilités concernant les allégations de crimes de guerre et de crimes contre l'humanité. Aussi bien pour les allégations de massacres de masse, de disparitions et de déplacements forcés, ou encore de déportation. La justice doit suivre son cours en toute transparence, en toute impartialité et en toute indépendance. Tous les mécanismes internationaux pertinents doivent être mis à profit pour que les auteurs d'atrocités puissent répondre de leurs actes devant la justice internationale. Le message de mon pays est clair. La guerre n'est pas un état de non-droit. Les parties au conflit doivent respecter les conventions internationales protégeant les civils et les infrastructures civiles en temps de guerre, notamment les conventions de Genève. Madame la Présidente, les standards qui sont appliqués à la guerre en Ukraine, à tous les niveaux, doivent aussi l'être pour tous les conflits armés et l'élan de compassion, d'assistance et de solidarité qui est, à juste titre, réservé à la guerre en Ukraine, doit pouvoir être identique pour toutes les victimes de conflits armés. Nous n'oublierons pas, au moins du bilan, le sort qui a été réservé à de nombreux Africains, parmi lesquels de jeunes étudiants, pour qui le chemin de l'exil a été très souvent parsemé de honte et d'humiliation, à cause de leur couleur de peau, de leur origine. De leur origine. Nombreux se sont vus refuser l'assistance dont ils avaient autant besoin que ceux dont ils partageaient la même communauté de souffrance et de peur et de détresse. Lorsque le cœur de nombreux bat pour les victimes de la guerre en Ukraine, le nôtre bat de concert avec eux. Et lorsque la discrimination s'ajoute à l'horreur de la guerre, l'humanité doit ensemble aussi se lever pour dénoncer avec force afin que le double standard ne soit plus la règle et que le bruit des chars et des tirs d'artillerie soit insupportable partout où il résonne. Madame la Présidente, il est urgent que la crise humanitaire consécutive à la guerre en Ukraine soit jugulée et que les effets soient rapidement circonscrits. Parier sur le temps c'est prendre le risque de voir plus de personnes innocentes tomber sous les balles, plus d'infrastructures civiles détruites, plus de familles déstructurées et des milliers d'enfants orphelins de guerre. Pour terminer, mon pays appelle les partis à la négociation, au respect du droit humanitaire, au respect des principes de la Charte des Nations Unies. Nous soutenons toutes les initiatives 
qui ravive l'espoir d'une solution négociée en, vie de, en vue de mettre fin à la guerre. Je vous remercie. Je remercie Son Excellence, M. Adamo, de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence, M. Sergei Lavrov, ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Fédération de Russie. Merci, mesdames et messieurs, Président, Votre Prévoschadiste, collègues. Как я понимаю, сегодняшнее заседание было мотивировано стремлением некоторых делегаций обсудить тему безнаказанности на Украине. И я считаю, что это весьма и весьма своевременно, потому что именно этот термин «безнаказанность» отражает то, что происходит в этой стране с 2014 года. Национал-радикальные силы, откровенные русофобы и неонацисты, пришли тогда к власти в результате вооруженного переворота при прямой поддержке западных стран. И сразу после этого встали на путь правового беспредела и тотального игнорирования основных прав и свобод человека. Право на жизнь, свободу слова, доступ к информации, свободу выражения мнения, свободу совести, право на использование родного языка. До сих пор остаются безнаказанными преступления на Майдане в феврале 2014 года, не найдены и не наказаны виновные в чудовищной трагедии в Одессе 2 мая 2014 года, когда в местном доме профсоюзов были заживо сожжены и погибли около 50 человек. В этом же ряду политические убийства Олеси Бузины, Павла Шеремета, других общественных деятелей и журналистов. И несмотря на это, нам сегодня пытаются навязать совершенно иной нарратив про российскую агрессию как первичную причину всех бед. Игнорируя при этом то, что более 8 лет украинской армии и боевики националистических формирований безнаказанно убивали и убивают жителей Донбасса только потому, что они отказались признать результаты преступного, кровавого, антиконституционного госпереворота в Киеве. Решили отстаивать свои права, которые были гарантированы Конституцией Украины, в том числе право на свободное использование родного русского языка. Вспомните, как... В 2015 году тогдашний премьер-министр Украины господин Яценюк заявил, что на Донбассе проживают не люди, а от него недалеко вышел нынешний президент господин Зеленский, который в очередном интервью в сентябре прошлого года, когда его спросили, что он думает о людях, живущих на Донбассе, он сказал, вы знаете, бывают люди, а бывают существа, особи. Это очень такая устойчивая характеристика украинского режима, как при Порошенко, так и при Зеленском. Они объявили всех несогласных с результатами госпереворота террористами. И 8 лет киевский режим проводит, так называемую, проводил войсковую операцию против мирного населения. Кстати сказать, на Украине уже много лет осуществляется тотальная мобилизация всего взрослого населения, включая женщин, кстати сказать, для того, чтобы рекрутировать их в ряды националистических батальонов и вооруженных сил Украины. Лицемерно заявляя о приверженности Минским соглашениям, киевские власти откровенно и безнаказанно саботировали их выполнение. Была введена финансовая, транспортная, энергетическая блокада Донбасса. Его жители отрезали от социальных пособий, пенсий, зарплат, банковских услуг связи, образования и здравоохранения, лишили элементарных гражданских прав, гарантированных в том числе международными пактами 1966 года об экономических, социальных и культурных правах, а также о гражданских и политических правах. В какой-то момент, устав притворяться, господин Зеленский заявил, что Минский комплекс мер нужен лишь для того, чтобы сохранять санкции, введенные против России. Еще более откровенным был его предшественник и соавтор Минских соглашений, господин Порошенко. Он пару месяцев назад публично и с гордостью заявил, что эти соглашения, которые он подписал, он, ни он, ни кто-то еще на Украине не собирались их выполнять. И что эти соглашения были нужны лишь для того, чтобы выиграть время для получения оружия от западных стран для войны с Российской Федерацией. В том же ключе недавно высказался секретарь Совета национальной безопасности и обороны Украины господин Данилов. Своей безнаказанностью киевский режим обязан, конечно же, западным кураторам, прежде всего Германии, Франции, ну и, разумеется, Соединенным Штатам. 
Вместо того, чтобы добиваться от киевского руководства выполнения Минских соглашений, и Берлин, и Париж, и Вашингтон цинично закрывали глаза на открытые угрозы Киева решить проблему Донбасса силой, так называемый план «Б». В последние годы киевский режим вел тотальное фронтальное наступление на русский язык, безнаказанно ущемлял в правах русское и русскоязычное население Украины. Были приняты скандальные языковые законы об образовании в 2017 году, об обеспечении функционирования украинского языка как государственного в 2019 год, о полном общем среднем образовании 2020 год, о коренных народах Украины 2021 год. Все они нацелены на вытеснение русского языка, по сути его полный запрет. Одновременно принимались законы, которые поощряли теорию и практику нацизма. Робкие рекомендации Венецианской комиссии Совета Европы, управление Верховного комиссара по правам человека, Верховного комиссара ОБСЕ по делам национальных меньшинств, о выправлении языков, языкового законодательства Киев игнорировал. И в свою очередь эти многосторонние структуры не нашли в себе смелости, а может быть им просто не позволили побудить украинские власти к исполнению взятых на себя международных обязательств в области прав человека. Министерство образования Украины исключило русский язык и русскую литературу и школьные программы. Запрещаются и уничтожаются, как в фашистской Германии, книги на русском языке, разрушаются памятники русским писателям. При государственной поддержке насаждается идеология национальной нетерпимости к этническим русским. И сегодня официальные лица этой страны уже не стесняются своей нацистской сущности, открыто и безнаказанно призывая к убийству русских людей. Вот несколько примеров. Посол Украины в Казахстане, господин Врублевский, теперь уже находящийся в Киеве, месяц назад заявил в интервью следующее, цитирую, «Стараемся их, русских, убить как можно больше. Чем больше мы убьем русских сейчас, тем меньше придется убивать нашим детям». Вот и все. Конец цитаты. Кто-нибудь обратил на это внимание? Ранее минувшей весной в том же духе высказался мэр Днепра Филатов, цитирую, «Пришло время холодной ярости, теперь у нас есть полное моральное право спокойно и с совершенно незамутненным разумом убивать этих нелюдей уже по всему миру, неограниченное количество времени и в максимально больших количествах». Конец цитаты. 13 сентября этого года, совсем недавно, господин Данилов заявил, цитирую, в тех населенных пунктах, куда заходят вооруженные силы Украины, жители будут украинизированы без учета их мнения. Это коснется не только русских людей, но и представителей других национальностей. И если у вас есть желание учиться дополнительно на каких-то других языках, румынских, польских, ивритах, пожалуйста, но не за счет нашего государства. За свой счет можете повышать свое образование. Надо ли говорить, что все эти русофобские выходки остались абсолютно безнаказанными? Тут уже не только о русофобии идет, идет речь. Он высказался о представителях других национальностей, которые проживают на Украине. Ну и, конечно, апофеозом стало интервью господина Зеленского 5 августа прошлого года, который посоветовал всем, кто чувствует себя русским, ради блага их детей, и их внуков убираться в Россию. Уезжайте в Россию, сказал он. И мне кажется, вот те решения, которые сейчас приняли э, жители целого ряда областей Украины о проведении референдумов, это ответ на его, на его пожелания. Под соусом борьбы с российской агрессией и сепаратизмом на Украине усиливается преследование инакомыслящих. В марте этого года введен запрет на деятельность 11 политических партий под предлогом их связей с Россией, Давно закрыты ведущие оппозиционные телеканалы на русском языке, блокируются неугодные правительству сайты. За попытку дать альтернативный официальному взгляд на положение дел подвергаются гонениям журналисты. В застенках СБУ находится видная украинская общественница Бережная, не раз выступавшая в ООН и ОБСЕ по поводу роста неонацизма на Украине. У нас нет сомнений, что Украина окончательно превратилась в тоталитарное государство нацистского толка, где безнаказанно попираются нормы международного гуманитарного права. Неудивительно, что вооруженные силы Украины и нацбатальоны применяют тактику террористов, используя мирных жителей в качестве живого щита.
На этом фоне особенно цинична позиция тех государств, которые накачивают Украину оружием и военной техникой, обучают персонал вооруженных сил этой страны. Цель очевидна. Они ее не скрывают, они ее декларируют. Максимально затянуть боевые действия, несмотря на жертвы и разрушения, для того, чтобы истощить и ослабить Россию. Такая линия означает прямую вовлеченность стран Запада в украинский конфликт, делает их его стороной. Преднамеренное разжигание этого конфликта коллективным Западом тоже остается безнаказанным. Ну, действительно, не будете же вы, господа, сами себя наказывать. У нас нет никаких иллюзий, что сегодня вооруженным силам России и ополчением Донецкой и Луганской народных республик противостоят не только неонацистские формирования киевского режима, но и военная машина, как я уже сказал, коллективного Запада. И в режиме реального времени с использованием современных систем, самолетов, кораблей, спутников, стратегических беспилотников НАТО снабжает разведданными вооруженные силы Украины и наускивает их на то, что Россия должна быть разгромлена на поле боя, об этом прямо и публично заявляют официальные представители Евросоюза, и лишена в качестве наказания, Россия должна быть лишена любого суверенитета. Это уже, знаете, это уже не латентный расизм, а самый, что ни на есть, откровенный. На фоне массированных обстрелов населенных пунктов Донбасса господин Зеленский радуется эффективности западного оружия. Вот его цитата, свеженькая. Наконец-то чувствуется, что очень мощно заработала западная артиллерия, то оружие, которое мы получили от наших партнеров, Точность действительно такая, как нужно, цинично заявил лидер этого государственного образования. При этом никаких военных или стратегических целей в обстреливаемых населенных пунктах поражено не было. Страдают только мирные жители Донбасса. С конца июля вооруженные силы Украины дистанционно минируют центр Донецка и его пригороды запрещенными противотанковыми, противопехотными минами «Лепесток». Их применение грубо нарушает конвенцию 1997 года, которую ратифицировала Украина, а также второй протокол к Женевской конвенции о запрете мин без самоликвидаторов. Такие бесчинства стали возможны и остаются безнаказанными из-за того, что США и их союзники при попустительстве международных правозащитных институтов 8 лет планомерно покрывают преступления киевского режима, устраивая свою политику в отношении Зеленского, исходя из известного американского принципа, он, конечно, сукин сын, но он наш сукин сын. Неудобная правда, которая омрачает светлый облик Украины как жертвы так называемой агрессии, старательно замалчивается, а иногда откровенно вымарывается. Даже западную правозащитную организацию Amnesty International, которую трудно заподозрить в симпатиях к России, подвергли суровой критике и записали в агента Кремля. Только за то, что в своем отчете эта структура подтвердила Всем известные факты о том, что Киев размещает боевые точки, тяжелые вооружения на гражданских объектах. Безнаказанными остаются преступные обстрелы Запорожской атомной электростанции боевиками киевского режима, которые создают риски ядерной катастрофы. И это несмотря на то, что с 1 сентября на станции постоянно присутствуют сотрудники МАГАТЭ, и установить сторону, виновную в обстрелах, не составляет никакого труда вообще. Напомню, кстати, что визит миссии МАГАТЭ на эту станцию был искусственно затянут, несмотря на то, что уже 3 июня все детали были согласованы, и миссия могла спокойно отправляться на Запорожскую атомную электростанцию. И потом возникла очень неблаговидная ситуация, когда Департамент безопасности секретариата ООН отказывался давать добро на конкретный маршрут, согласованный Россией и МАГАТЭ. Затем стал заявлять, что МАГАТЭ самостоятельно определяет все параметры этой миссии. Это не очень чистоплотная затея, она затянула посещение Запорожской атомной станции миссии МАГАТЭ на два месяца. Даже на три месяца, я прошу прощения, 3 июня, да, практически три месяца. Вот, серьезную тревогу мы испытываем в отношении судьбы российских военнослужащих, попавших в руки украинских националистов. Имеются многочисленные свидетельства жестокого обращения с ними, включая бессудные расправы в нарушении требований международного гуманитарного права. 
Я уверен, что те, кто интересуется реальными событиями на Украине, видели а, видеозапись расправы украинских нацистов над российскими военнопленными, которых, которых бросили на землю со связанными за спиной руками и расстреливали в голову. Кто-нибудь из э, представленных здесь стран каким-то образом комментировал это преступление? У нас есть масса свидетельств этих и иных преступных деяний киевского режима, которые совершаются регулярно с 2014 года. Российские правоохранительные органы в сотрудничестве с коллегами из Донецкой и Луганской народных республик тщательно фиксируют и расследуют факты преступлений. Установлена причастность более 220 лиц, включая представителей высшего командования вооруженных сил Украины, командиров воинских подразделений, которые обстреливали мирное население. Расследуются уголовные дела в отношении граждан Британии, Канады, США, Нидерландов по фактам наемничества и совершения преступных действий на Украине. Я заверяю вас, что все виновные, вне зависимости от их гражданства, будут привлечены к ответственности. И еще раз хочу обратить ваше внимание на следующее. Когда российские и украинские переговорщики в Стамбуле в конце марта практически согласились над предложенными Киевом параметрами урегулирования, через пару дней произошла трагедия в Буче. То, что она имела постановочный характер, ни у кого не остается сомнений. И обращаю ваше внимание, дорогие господа, что западные коллеги сразу после этой инсценировки подняли истерику и ввели новый пакет санкций против Российской Федерации, голословно обвинив нас в том, что мы совершили убийство мирных граждан. С тех пор, когда был этот пропагандистский эффект реализован, Никто об этой буче не вспоминает, кроме нас. Я еще раз обращаюсь в присутствии генерального секретаря и уважаемых министров. Пожалуйста, добейтесь от украинских властей, чтобы они сделали элементарный шаг. Опубликовали имена тех людей, чьи трупы были показаны в городе Буче. Я об этом прошу уже не один месяц. Никто не слышит, никто не хочет реагировать. Уважаемый господин генеральный секретарь, хотя бы... Вы употребите свой авторитет, пожалуйста. Я думаю, всем будет полезно разобраться с этим эпизодом. Вот. И, конечно, мы обратили внимание на возросшую активность международного правосудия применительно к Украине. Рекламируются некие усилия по расследованию преступлений на Украине, которые приписываются российским военным. Все это носит заказной характер, мы это прекрасно видим. И еще раз напомню, что ни кровавый госпереворот в 2014 году, ни трагедия в Одессе 2 мая того же года, ни обстрелы мирных городов Донбасса, бомбежка самолетами военно-воздушных сил Украины Луганска 2 июня 2014 года и многие другие факты не стали поводом для какой-либо внятной реакции со стороны Международного уголовного суда. Кстати, в этот Международный уголовный суд было направлено более трех тысяч сообщений о преступлениях против жителей Донбасса, и никакой реакции не последовало. Видимо, сейчас руководство этого так называемого судебного органа получило команду свыше о том, чтобы они развили свою бурную деятельность. Никакого доверия к этому органу у нас не осталось. Мы долгие восемь лет напрасно ждали, когда начнется борьба с безнаказанностью на Украине. И больше не рассчитываем на справедливость со стороны этого, да и целого ряда других международных институтов. Время ожидания закончилось. Все сказанное мной лишний раз подтверждает, что решение о проведении специальной военной операции было неизбежным. Мы об этом не раз говорили, предъявили огромное количество фактов, которые показывают, как готовилась Украина исполнять роль антироссии, роль плацдарма для создания и реализации угроз против российской безопасности. Смею вас заверить, что мы этого не допустим. Благодарю вас за внимание. Я благодарю Сон Экселенс, мистер Лавров, за свою декларацию. Я даю слово Сон Экселенс, мистер Джеймс Клеверли, министр Афферс Этранжер, Коммонвелс и Девелопмент. Du Royaume-Uni de Grande-Bretagne et d'Irlande du Nord. 
Uh, Madam President, Mr. Secretary, uh, Mr. Secretary General, uh, Mr. Khan, thank you. 77 years ago, UN members agreed solemn principles in the UN Charter, vital for international peace and security. They undertook to refrain from the threat or the use of force against the territorial integrity or the political independence of any state. Yet, seven months ago, President Putin invaded Ukraine illegally and without justification. He ignored the resounding pleas for peace that I heard in this council on the 17th of February. Since then, Ukrainian spirit of defense and defiance in the protection of their country continues to inspire free peoples and nations. Every day, the devastating consequences of Russia's invasion become more clear. UN agencies have confirmed more than 14,000 civilian casualties so far. And the actual total is likely to be much higher. More than 17 million Ukrainians in humanitarian need. 7 million displaced within Ukraine. And more than 7 million Ukrainian refugees in Europe. We see the mounting evidence of Russian atrocities against civilians, including indiscriminate shelling and targeted attacks on over 200 medical facilities and 40 educational institutions and horrific acts of sexual violence. We see from the reports of the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights that in parts of Ukraine currently under Russian control, civilians are subject to torture, arbitrary detention, and forced deportation to Russia. And we have seen more grisly discoveries in Izium. And it's not just Ukrainians who are the victims. President Putin's war has spread hardship and food insecurity across the globe, plunging millions of the world's most vulnerable into hunger and famine. And once again, as we've seen here today, Russia has sought to deny responsibility. It has tried to lay the blame on those who have rightly imposed sanctions on President Putin's regime in response to his illegal actions. Let us be clear, we are not sanctioning food. It is Russia's actions that are preventing food and fertilizer getting to developing countries. It is Russia's tactics and bombs that are to blame for destroying Ukraine's farms, infrastructure, and delaying its exports. I sat here in February listening to the Russian representative assuring this council that Russia had no intention of invading its neighbor. We now know that was a lie. And today, I have listened to further installments of Russia's catalogues of distortions, dishonesty, and disinformation. He has left the chamber. I'm not surprised. I don't think Mr. Lavrov wants to hear the collective condemnation of this council. But we saw through him then, and we saw through him again today. We have information, which means that we know that Russia is about to hold sham referenda on sovereign Ukrainian territory with no basis in law, under the threat of violence, after mass displacements of people in areas that voted overwhelmingly for Ukrainian independence. We know what Vladimir Putin is doing. He is planning to fabricate the outcome of those referenda. He is planning to use that to annex sovereign Ukrainian territory. And he is planning to use it as a further pretext to escalate his aggression. 
that is what he plans to do. And we call on all countries to reject this charade and to refuse to recognize any results. We are used to seeing Russian lies and distortions. But let us listen to the testimony of Ukrainians who tell us the truth, who tell us the reality of President Putin's war. Dr. Olena Yuzvak, her husband, Ole, and their 22-year-old son, Dmitry, were abducted by Russian forces from their home in Hostomel near Bucha in March. Russian soldiers shot Ole twice in the legs before they were all blindfolded and bundled into an armored personnel carrier. And I want you to hear Olnea's story in her own words, and I quote, first they took us to a bombed out house. The Russian soldiers kept saying they were going to kill us. My husband was left for hours lying on the floor in the pool of his blood. I don't know why, we'd done nothing wrong. Then they took my son away from us. I don't know where. I don't know if we'll ever see him again. I just want my boy back." End of quote. Olena's story and those of many others tell us the truth, the real truth. This is a war of annexation, a war of conquest to which President Putin now wants to send even more of Russia's young men and women, making peace even less likely. Less likely. Mr. Putin must understand the world is watching and we will not give up. Of members of the Security Council, we must unequivocally reject Russia's attempts to annex Ukrainian territory. We must make clear to President Putin that his attack on the Ukrainian people must stop, that there can be no impunity for those perpetrating atrocities, and that he must withdraw from Ukraine and restore regional and global stability. If he chose to, he could stop this war, a war which has done untold damage to the Ukrainian and the Russian peoples. His war is an assault on Ukraine an assault on the UN Charter, and an assault on the international norms that protect us all. So, we stand with our Ukrainian friends for as long as it takes, because Ukraine's fight for freedom is the world's fight for freedom. It is our fight for freedom. And if Ukraine's sovereignty and territory are not respected, then no country is truly secure. These are the reasons why Ukraine can and must win. Thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Cleverly de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Madame Charlie Ayorkor Boche, ministre des Affaires étrangères et de l'intégration régionale du Ghana. Madame President, Excellencies. Let me thank France for organizing this high-level meeting. I would also like to thank Secretary General Antonio Guterres for setting the tone for this meeting with his very clear statement. We welcome also the briefing from Mr. Karim Khan, the prosecutor of the ICC. The world has been united since this council's referral over Darfur in resolution 1593, 2005, nearly two decades ago, that impunity anywhere poses serious threats to international peace and security, the international legal order, and our multilateral system. We have systematically reinforced our institutions and defined conduct and sanctions to expose, prevent, or punish those acts or behavior that defy the norms we are committed to live by. No state, however powerful, should get a pass. To do so unravels a central tenet 
of our global civilization. It puts at stake the lives and liberties of those less powerful, wherever they live. That is why the members of this council must act in an urgent and unified manner to end the near paralysis of the council and the war in Ukraine. The toll of that war is intolerable and the lack of unified resolve risks making our universal organization an enabling factor for impunity in Ukraine. The damage to the standing of the charter may be incalculable. Ghana is especially concerned about the intensification of the war in Ukraine across several lines, with civilian populated areas and civilian infrastructure being the targets of bombardments. We regret that the basic laws which govern the conduct of modern warfare and protect ordinary people who are caught in the crossfires of war have not been respected. We are distressed by the diverse, horrifying, and painful humanitarian threats which have accompanied the war. Some 14 million people, mostly women and children, have been displaced from their homes and face heightened risk of conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence. Human trafficking, filtration processes, and forced disappearances, torture, and other violations of the rights and freedoms of the people are widespread. We remain gravely concerned by the manifest threats of a nuclear episode, whether by accident or deliberate action, because of the constant military engagements around the Zaporozhia nuclear, nuclear power plant. The disregard for the requisites for nuclear safety and security, including for the delineation of a safe zone, are deplorable. And we support the efforts by the International Atomic Energy Agency to avert a nuclear catastrophe. With the rising death toll, civilian casualties, and growing reports of war crimes and other human rights violations, we must uphold our responsibility as a council and send a clear message that perpetrators of atrocities would be held to account. The suffering in Ukraine is abhorrent and should not be dismissed as the mere consequence of war. To do so, we would be endorsing the atrocities and sanctioning impunity. In this regard, we underscore the importance of ensuring accountability for all war crimes committed in Ukraine. Accountability is fundamental to preventing impunity. We must affirm our determination that the litany of atrocious acts that have taken place in Ukraine would be submitted to thorough, transparent, and independent investigations to establish the facts and for the attribution of international crimes to their perpetrators. Ghana remains supportive of international accountability measures, including the various investigative processes being undertaken by the ICC and the Human Rights Council. We believe that in seeking criminal accountability and justice for the victims of the war in Ukraine, the important questions about international remedy and reparation measures, especially for victims of conflict-related sexual abuses must be addressed. We also express our support for the United Nations early recovery and resilience programs already being undertaken. Madam President, we have, we have expressed several times a principled position against the aggression on Ukraine, which we consider to be a disregard for the rules of international law and the principles of the Charter. Ukraine as a sovereign state and a member of this organization has every right, we believe, and indeed a responsibility to defend its territorial integrity and political independence. We recognize the tremendous courage and resilience of the Ukrainian people. Ghana does not and will not recognize any territory that is unilaterally and forcefully required or acquired as dismembered from a sovereign entity. We reiterate the call on the Russian Federation 
to immediately and unconditionally cease its operations, withdraw its troops from the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine, and respect its neighbor's sovereignty and political independence. The need for a credible pathway for a genuine diplomatic process is urgent. The barrel of the gun does not provide such a pathway. It only leads to needless loss of lives and destruction on both sides. Indeed, the costs of the war have been high, not only for the parties, but also for the rest of the world. As the President of Ghana said yesterday in his statement at the General Assembly, I quote, every bullet, every bomb, every shell that hits a target in Ukraine hits our pockets and our economies in Africa, unquote. In this regard, let me place on record Ghana's appreciation for the good offices of the Secretary General and other international actors to leverage life-saving humanitarian interventions at critical times of the war. We already note some positive impacts from the Black Sea Grain Initiative and urge the continuous and unrestricted shipment of grains to countries facing food insecurity. We encourage all stakeholders to reach an early agreement for the export of Russian fertilizers and crop products, especially needed for agrarian dependent economies. Madam President, let me conclude with an appeal. In a week when the eyes of the world are on us and millions around the world look to the United Nations for leadership and hope, we must send a strong message that impunity will not be tolerated, that we need to act through concerted diplomacy to end the war in Ukraine. I thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence Madame Boche de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Carlos Alberto Franco Franza, ministre des Affaires étrangères du Brésil. Merci. Madame la Présidente, je remercie la France d'avoir organisé la présente séance. The conflict in Ukraine affects us all, even in regions far from where hostilities are taking place. The Security Council is the appropriate forum to seek a solution that ensures lasting peace. This week marks seven months since the start of the conflict. Tens of thousands of people, men of then innocent civilians, lost their lives. There are millions of refugees and internally displaced persons whose return to their homes remains uncertain and who, with the approach of Fuinta, are faced with the prospect of a worsening humanitarian crisis. Over these seven months, this Council has received numerous reports of serious human rights violations in the conflict zone, including against vulnerable groups, women and children. Brazil condemns the abuses and defends an impartial investigation of the facts so that those responsible are held accountable for their actions. We also reiterate our call for full respect for international humanitarian law by all parties. Madame la Présidente, we have an urgent task before us to engage the parties in dialogue in order to secure an immediate ceasefire and the opening of negotiations for a peace agreement. The continuation of the hostilities endangers the lives of innocent civilians and jeopardizes the food and energy security of millions of families in other regions, especially in developing countries. The risks of escalation arising for the current dynamics of the conflict are simply too great and its consequences for the world order unpredictable. Only diplomacy brings the prospect of viable solutions to conflicts between states. It is not the time to accentuate divisions or isolate parties. The priority of this Council must be to create conditions for the parties to engage in negotiations for a peaceful solution to the conflict. Thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Franzal sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Madame. Rim Al-Hashimi, ministre d'État à la coopération internationale au ministère des Affaires étrangères 
et de la coopération internationale des Émirats arabes unis. Merci, Madame la Ministre. Seyda Raïssa, Bidaïdhan, à ta kadem la kum, biwafir shukr à la akdi hada l'ichima al-ham, wa shukr mausulon aïdan li maali l'amin al-ham li l'umam al-mutahida, à Seyd Antonio Gutierrez, wa li maali Seyd Karim Khan, à l'muddai l'ham fil mahkam al-janaïe al-duali à la ihapati himal qayyimatain. La shaka an nandila al-harf fi Ukrania, kana lahu asda on muhtalifa, fil mujtama al-duali. فالبعض استشعر أنها تنذر بشلل في منظومة العمل متعدد الأطراف وتخوف آخر من كونها بعث جديد لمخاطر وجودية ظنها اندثرت وأخيرا هنالك من يرى خلفها عودة للقطبية التاريخية وتداعياتها الدولية وما كان لذاك التنوع في الرؤى إلا أن ينعكس في مواقف الدول والتي تضمنت تباينا حول كيفية معالجة الأزمة والذي تجسد مرارا في مداولات هذا المجلس وهذه المنظمة وبالرغم مما تحتويه من فروقات واضحة إلا أن مواقف الدول تضمنت أيضا إجماعا راجحا حول مرجعية القانون الدولي وضرورة احترامه يعود لكونه الفيصل بين ازدهار الحضارة وانعدامها في النظام العالمي حيث سن القانون الدولي كما يعبر ميثاق الأمم المتحدة ضوابط لتعاملات الدول وممارساتها المبنية على مبادئ السيادة والاستقلال وحسن الجوار ووحدة وسلامة الأرض والتي شكلت روافد لأمن الدول وإنمائها ولا تمتثل في ذلك لتفاوت القوة أو الحجم السيد الرئيسة لن تحيد الإمارات العربية المتحدة عن دعوتها الصريحة ومناشدتها الثابتة لكافة أطراف هذه الحرب بالالتزام بالقانون الدولي وبشكل خاص القانون الدولي الإنساني واحترام حدوده والعمل بمقتضياته وفي هذا الصدد إن مفاد التقارير عن خروقات يومية لهذا القانون مدعاة لقلقنا البالغ حول ما آلت الحرب على المدنيين بالذات ونشير هنا إلى وضع النساء والأطفال المهجرين منهم على وجه الخصوص والذي تورد التقارير باستمرار تعرضهم للعنف الجنسي والاستغلال من قبل عصابات الجريمة المنظمة بما في ذلك الإتجار بالبشر وجميعنا يعلم كيف أن للحروب والنزاعات المسلحة وقع أكثر عنفا وشدة على النساء والفتيات لذلك فإننا نرحب بكافة الجهود القائمة بما في ذلك من قبل مؤسسات الأمم المتحدة لمعالجة الوضع الإنساني مع مراعاة خصوصية عواقب الحرب عليهن ومع ضرورة التوصل إلى وقف الأعمال العدائية يظل السلام هدفنا الأسمى والذي تتطلب استدامته مصالحة شاملة مدعمة بالمساءلة والعدالة لضحايا الحرب وكما نكرر ضرورة مشاركة المرأة بدورها في حل النزاع وإرساء السلام بشكل كامل وفاعل ومتساوي والذي يعكس ليس فقط خصوصية تجربتها في الحرب بل ومركزية منظورها في صناعة السلام السيدة الرئيسة ستستمر دولة الإمارات في مسلكها الداعي للحوار وخفض التصعيد والتأجيج وتشجيع التعاون وصياغة توافق يضمن الاستقرار في الدول وبينها ونذكر هنا بملاحظة مهمة لا يختلف القانون الدولي عن نظيره المحلي في أن الاستثناءات من دونه من دون عواقب طبعة الممارسة في سباق إلى القاع وفي الختام أكرر نداء بلادي إلى الطرفين وجميع الجهات الفاعلة بالسعي لحل سلمي ينهي هذه الحرب من خلال حوار جامع بناء والذي يتطلب ترك قنوات الاتصال مفتوحة وطريق العودة مشرعة إبقاء لأفق الحل الدبلوماسي وكما هو جلي أمامنا فإن العالم بمختلف مكوناته قلق من تبعات هذه الحرب بما في ذلك على النظام الدولي 
وأمن الغذاء والطاقة ومخاطر تعاظم هذه المواجهة ولذلك فعلينا تحمل المسؤولية الملقاة علينا والتعاون من أجل أن نحدث نقلة في تجاوز التحديات العالمية الكبرى بدلا من المزيد من الانتكاسات بسبب الحروب والصراعات إن هذا النهج والمناداة به هو خلاصة تجربتنا في منطقة الشرق الأوسط والتي أنهكت شعوبها من التصميم العنيد على الهيمنة وإلغاء الآخر وإيثار المصالح الضيقة والذي لم ولن يخلف إلا دمارا وشكرا السيدة الرئيسة Je remercie Madame Alchimie, Alchimie de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Georges Orina, directeur général au ministère des Affaires étrangères du Kenya. Um, Madame President, Excellences, Madame President, Kenya's delegation commends you and France for the able stewardship of the Security Council during the month of September. I thank the Secretary General Antonio Guterres and Mr. Karim Khan for their updates on the situation in the Ukraine. The war in the Ukraine is a serious breach of the United Nations Charter. The obligation to respect the territorial integrity of all member states will be further undermined should any action be taken to change the legal character of the areas in eastern Ukraine. We are in a moment of grave danger to international peace and security. The escalation of the war the international uh, community feared is underway. There are now clear threats being issued about the potential deployment of weapons of mass destruction in the conflict. On the battlefield, civilians are being subjected to serious harm in contravention of the fundamental international law and human rights obligations. It is a priority of the utmost agency that national authorities subject their soldiers to severe disciplinary action for any abuses, especially on civilians and captured combatants. Military commanders should surrender those suspected for such atrocities to the relevant authorities for prosecution. All the parties including those making allegations of human rights abuses or all those against whom the allegations are made should agree to prompt independent and impartial investigations. Even as we justly condemn and call for accountability of war-related violations, we know that the truest protection of civilians is to stop the war. In this regard, Kenya calls for an immediate cessation of hostilities. Active hostilities should be replaced by a mediated agreement that secures the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Ukraine while addressing the security concerns of all parties and regional stakeholders. Madam President, the situation in Ukraine is highlighting the need for serious reforms of the United Nations Security Council. His Excellency Dr. William Ruto, President of the Republic of Kenya, in his speech yesterday at the General Assembly, called for the democratization of the Security Council if its damaged legitimacy is not to be totally destroyed. Our President made the clarion call that it was time that the Council more powerfully heeded the voice and place of Africa through reform of its membership. He welcomed President Joe Biden's announcement calling for the permanent and non-permanent membership of the Council to be expanded. If there is a major result the world needs from Ukraine, beyond peace and security for the people of Ukraine, it is for such an announcement to lead to real change. The farmers, villagers, pastoralists, fish folk, traders and workers of Africa need their livelihoods protected from the climate crisis. They need the many serious conflicts on the Security Council agenda solved 
are not relegated to the margins because of the Ukraine? Who will protect the in their interests in the Security Council by having the means from an amended UN Charter? Only permanent membership by the African states will do. In this regard, we call on the entire permanent membership to commit to fully embracing reforms. It is the only way the people of the world will consider this institution legitimate enough to earn their regard and cooperation. Madam President, I conclude by saluting the individuals, institutions, and governments, as well as the UN bodies and agencies that continue to help alleviate the suffering of those affected by the war in Ukraine. I reaffirm Kenya's respect for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized border. I thank you for your kind attention. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Orina pour sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Dmitro Kuleba, ministre des Affaires étrangères de l'Ukraine. Madam President, distinguished members of the Security Council, Secretary General Guterres, Prosecutor Hahn, I thank the French Presidency for keeping the focus of the Security Council on the most pressing threat to international peace and security in this century, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Right as we speak, bodies of innocent victims are still being exhumed from at least 445 graves in the recently liberated city of Izum. Some are not entire bodies, but only parts of them, like a few pairs of children's legs in one of the graves. The grief of those who are close and beloved is yet another drop in the ocean of suffering that Russia has inflicted upon the people of Ukraine since seven months and eight years of its barbaric aggression. Many of you may have seen the image of a dead hand of a 36 years old Ukrainian soldier. His name was Sergei Sova, with a yellow and blue bracelet still on it. I do wear one too. Just want to show it to you. Many of us do. And Russia should know one thing. It will never be able to kill all of us. And here is why. Because on February 24th, when Russia attacked Ukraine from all directions, within the first 24 hours, tens of thousands of Ukrainians returned from abroad to defend their country. And what happened within the first 24 hours after President Putin announced mobilization? The opposite. Thousands of Russians booked international flights to leave Russia. Many flights were sold out within hours. Yesterday, Putin announced mobilization. But what he really announced before the whole world was his defeat. You can draft 300, 500,000 people, but you will never win this war. Today, every Ukrainian is a weapon ready to defend Ukraine and the principles enshrined in the UN Charter. Russia will fail and will bear full responsibility for the crime of aggression and consequent war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Yesterday, President Zelensky made it clear in his address that Russian responsibility is a key element to international peace and security. Ukrainian law enforcement, together with partners at the International Criminal Court and countries who support both Ukraine and the ICC, work collectively to collect evidence of Russian crimes and hold perpetrators to account. We trust in the International Criminal Court. Justice will be served. We owe it not only to thousands of victims, but to future, future generations in Ukraine and beyond. There will be no peace without justice. I emphasize that none of the Russian crimes in Ukraine would have been possible without the crime of aggression against Ukraine committed by Russian leadership. It cannot go unpunished. 
And the only feasible way to put President Putin and his entourage on trial is to establish a special tribunal for the crime of aggression against Ukraine. I reiterate my call on all states to back this undertaking for the sake of the very basic principles of humanity and the UN Charter. Excellencies, many of you may listen to me right now with one question in mind. Is there a chance for peace? Will Ukraine negotiate with Russia in order to end this war? I want to state crystal clear. No other nation in the world craves for peace more than Ukraine. President Zelensky was very outspoken about it yesterday. We have never wanted anything but peace and stable development. We have never wanted this war and never chose it. We simply want to live normal life. But it's not enough for Ukraine to want peace. Russia must prioritize diplomacy over war in order to give peace a chance. What we see instead is Russian leadership seeking a military solution only. Distinguished colleagues, this chamber has seen many heated debates since 1945, many crises. But the amount of lies coming from the Russian diplomats is quite extraordinary. Today, we are mostly focusing on crimes committed by Russian soldiers in Ukraine. But if anyone thinks they are the only one ready to kill, torture, rape, cut off genitals, they are wrong. Russian diplomats are directly complicit because their lies incite these crimes and cover them up. Apparently, the only thing in today's address by Russia in this torrent of lies worthy of reaction is the inappropriate slang used when mentioning a president of a foreign country, the president of Ukraine. I also noted today that Russian diplomats flee almost as aptly as Russian soldiers. Before February 24th, Russian diplomats here at the United Nations had repeatedly denied plans of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The Russian president himself lied into the face of European leaders, saying he was not planning to attack. It was days before the invasion. Russia is shameless. They sit at the chair they occupied in 1991 on dubious legal grounds, armed with a veto right and the feeling of total impunity. Russians are confident that they can get away with anything and they are entitled to do anything they want. They think this seat allows them to violate borders in a 19th century style imperialist conquest. They think it allows them to shell nuclear power plants and seize them. They think it allows them to unleash missile terror on civilians and critical infrastructure. They think it allows them to threaten the world with the use of nuclear weapons. They must be held accountable for all of this. The issue of responsibility is central to the debate. We need to ensure that behavior like this is punishable. Otherwise, every force in the world, every evil force in the world, will be tempted to follow in Russia's footsteps. I don't need to remind anyone at this table how many forces on the planet would like to question the borders of their neighbors. If Russia can do this, why can't they? Today, we're talking not only about Ukraine and Russia. The global security crisis we all face is so much larger. All members of the Council must realize that on February 24th, Russia attacked not only Ukraine, it dealt a deadly blow, blow to the very foundations of the United Nations Charter. No nation can feel safe until Russia is held to account for violating the common principles agreed by all after the Second World War. Russia does not care for them. But there are 192 other UN member states, nations of Asia, the Pacific, Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, and Europe are all interested in upholding the UN Charter today. And Ukraine is fighting to defend principles of this Charter, especially the principle of territorial integrity. 
Madam President, Russia's war of aggression has plunged the world into a multifaceted crisis. The consequences of this crime are felt far beyond Ukraine. Once Russian warships blocked Ukrainian seaports, it became clear that Ukrainian agricultural exports are vital to global food security. Russia has demonstrated that it is ready to put millions of people across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East at the risk of hunger simply to achieve its imperialistic goals. I take this opportunity to thank UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres and Turkey for facilitating the Black Sea Grain Initiative that allowed Ukraine to resume maritime grain exports this summer. Putin recently lied when he said that most of the grain has been sent to European countries. In fact, two-thirds of the grain we shipped went to consumers in Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. The resumption of Ukrainian exports has tamed food prices and allowed to ease the acute food insecurity, especially for those most vulnerable. Today, the Black Sea Grain Initiative is under threat. Russian officials are questioning the effectiveness of the corridor and might prepare to block the extension of the initiative once the agreed 120 days are over in November. We must not allow Russia to resume its hunger games with the world. I therefore urge all nations, especially those depending on Ukrainian food experts, to put maximum public and diplomatic pressure on Moscow, demanding to keep the Black Sea Grain Corridor functioning in November and beyond. We need to protect the Vital Grain Initiative together. Ukraine reminds a global food security guarantor. Despite our own dire situation, we decided to provide humanitarian aid to Ethiopia and Somalia, sending them an additional amount of our grains. Ukraine is interested in increasing maritime export volumes, both under the UN food program and on market conditions. While hitting peaceful Ukrainian cities with missiles, Russia uses food and energy as weapons against the rest of the world. Putin sends tanks into Ukraine to kill Ukrainians while stealing the well-being and stability from every European household with energy blackmail and playing hunger games with Asian, African, Middle Eastern families by threatening the functioning of the grain corridor. We are in the same boat, all of us. Europeans, Asians, Africans, Arab nations, Latin American states, we are in the same boat. And we must confront these threats together. There is no place for neutrality. I said back in February here at the United Nations that no nation will be able to sit out this crisis created by Russia. It still stands. The best reaction to this crisis stand with Ukraine to protect the UN Charter. Russia likes to talk about the developed world and the developing world. He, they try to drive a wedge between ones and the others. We in Ukraine do not differentiate. All people deserve a normal life, safety, stability, and confidence. But we must stay united to stop Russia's blackmail and the war on humanity it launched. Dear colleagues, the most important pillar of international peace and security is the territorial integrity of states. No country is allowed to change internationally recognized borders by force. Russia has badly damaged this principle, and now the threat of war is hanging over everyone's head. To restore international peace and security, we need urgent and decisive action. Yesterday, President Zelensky proposed a peace formula which includes not only accountability, but a mechanism of security guarantees based on Article 51 of the UN Charter. Ukraine has developed the Kyiv Security Compact, proposing a modern, multi-layered mechanism of guarantees to ensure Ukraine's security until the moment it becomes part of NATO. This document, though, is much broader than a tool of guarantee to guarantee the security of Ukraine only. We see it as a universal mechanism that can be considered and applied to other countries and contexts in order to strengthen regional and global security architecture. Ukraine keeps working with partners to realize the vision of the Kyiv Security Compact. This is our 
added value to international peace and security for all UN member states. Thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Kouleba de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Jan Lipavski, ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Tchéquie. Thank you, Madam President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies. Let me thank the French Presidency for the opportunity to participate in this important meeting. The Czech Republic now holds the rotating EU Presidency. The EU is a core promoter of values and principles of the UN Charter. Czechia hosts the highest number of Ukrainian refugees per capita, over 400,000 in 10 million countries. Russia's colonial, unprovoked and illegal war of aggression against Ukraine sent this massive wave of the most vulnerable population abroad. Russian aggression is perhaps the most dangerous challenge to global peace in recent decades. Today, it is about Ukraine. Tomorrow, it may be another country. In August 1968, it was Czechoslovakia, invaded by Moscow-led troops, a crackdown on the so-called Prague Spring, a violent interference in another country's peaceful life, turning my country into an occupied colony. We are hearing about the hastily organized sham referendums in part of Ukraine. Russia cannot trick the international community and steal again another state's territory. Russia's aggressive colonial policy and imperial desires must be rejected for good. Ukraine refused the slavery and bravely, bravely fights for a multilateral world where rules protect peace. We are horrified by the atrocities committed by Russian troops in Mariupol, Bucha, Irpin, Izium, and elsewhere. And extremely concerned by the reports on the so-called filtration camps run by Russia in Ukraine. Hundreds of thousands of Ukraine citizens have been deported to Russia, including children. There are testimonies of sexual and gender-based crimes used as a method of warfare. All must be investigated and perpetrators must be held accountable. We applaud the Secretary General for launching the UN fact-finding mission on events in Olenivka. More than 40 states, including Czechia, referred the situation in Ukraine to the ICC, which opened its investigation into the situation in Ukraine already in March. We strongly support the ICC, including by seconding a public prosecutor and by voluntary contributions. And we call for establishment of a special international tribunal to prosecute the crime of aggression committed by Russia. Czech law, law enforcement agencies have launched criminal investigation of certain crimes based on, a, on the principle of universal jurisdiction. The Security Council members bear global responsibility for peace and respect to international law. Please act. We need peace in Ukraine. We need to restore respect for the UN Charter and international law. We need to ensure justice for victims and to stop impunity of the perpetrators. Thank you very much. Je remercie Son Excellence Monsieur Lipavski de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Madame Annalena Baerbock, ministre fédérale des Affaires étrangères de l'Allemagne. Madame la ministre. Madame President, dear colleagues, Bucha, Mariupol, Isium. When we talk about the horrors of the unfolding war in Ukraine, we are not talking about abstract reports. We are talking about children, we are talking about mothers, about brothers, about fathers, about grandparents, women and men whose pain is raw. Therefore, I urge Russia, this is a war 
you will not win. So end the war. Stop the suffering in Ukraine. Stop sending more of your own citizens into death. Stop your shame referendums, which are as unlawful as the war they are supposed to legitimize. Stop the grain war that is driving hunger across the globe, especially in the South. And stop paralyzing this very body, the United Nations Security Council. For many of you here and for some in the General Assembly, this war might have seen like the regional war far away in February 24th. Because in many parts of the world, there's too much suffering itself driven by conflict, driven by climate catastrophe, driven by the pandemic and by hunger. We did hear this. We in Germany, we could also feel you in this understanding. But I think we all feel together now here in the Security Council, but also in the General Assembly, that since the last 200 days, what is happening can leave nobody around the globe untouched. Now, for 200 days of Russia's brutal war in Ukraine, President Putin's most recent announcements make it clear beyond any doubt. Russia is not conducting a so-called special operation. Russia is leading a full-fledged war of aggression with war crimes, with torture, with rape, even of children. Russia's war is since 200 days is also increasing the hunger, the poverty, the insurgency in the world all around the globe. And I think this is a clear sign that the Russian foreign minister only came in for his own speech and then spoke for quite some while, but didn't even mention the hunger, the poverty, the results all around the world. And today in the streets of Moscow, there are no queues of volunteers wanting to join the war in Ukraine. What we see instead are courageous men, women, and even children taking to the streets because they do not want to be part of this war against Ukraine, and they want not to be part of the hunger war in the world. These men and women feel what we all feel, regardless of where we heal from north, south, east, or west. That all this war brings is pain, death, and destruction. Today, here in this chamber, we have to ask, therefore, ourselves, if we let a permanent member of this council launch such a war of aggression against this neighbor, what would this mean for the United Nations? For an institution whose charter states that, I quote, all members shall refrain from the threat of use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. If the charter means anything to us, we must not stand idle by, but live the spirit of this, of our charter. Not in spite of, but particularly because of one member misuses its special veto rights in the Security Council. Live up the spirit of our, of this Charter of the United Nations as it has been lifted up by the UN and our Turkish partners who brokered the grain deal. As it is a world food program, which is also supported by Germany, that is shipping the grain to Yemen and to the Horn of Africa. Live up the spirit of United Nations, as the United Nations and the International Criminal Court that collect evidence to ensure that the perpetrators in this war are held accountable. Lift the spirit of the United Nations as the IEAA that is working to prevent a catastrophe at the Saporizhia power plant and whose efforts are supporting in talks with all sides. Lift up the spirit of the United Nations in contrast to the Russian president because we are the United Nations from north to south, from east to west, no matter how small, no matter how big. Thank you, Madam President.
Je remercie Son Excellence Madame Berbock de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence Monsieur Xibniew Frau, ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Pologne. Thank you, thank you, Madam President. Dear Ministers, the main reason behind today's meeting is Russia's decision to attack its neighbor, a fellow member state of the United Nations. Russia, despite being a permanent member of the Security Council, whose responsibility for international peace and security should be even greater, decided to breach the most fundamental principles of our world order. The invasion has shown the total disrespect and disregard for international humanitarian law and human rights law. The Russian forces have committed horrific atrocities, extrajudicial executions of civilians, enforced disappearances, torture, or sexual violence, including against children. Unable to crack Ukraine's military resistance, Russia turned to terror against civilians as a basic tactics of its war. Each day brings new evidence and testimonies of Russian crimes committed in the occupied territories. We are shocked by the discovery of chambers of torture and mass graves containing bodies showing signs of torture and brutality in newly liberated Izium. With new reports coming, Izium may become another symbol of Russia's barbaric methods. Against this dire background, Poland continues to advocate for full accountability for all the violations and compensation for the inflicting damage. We support the investigations by Ukrainian prosecutors, investigations initiated by other states. We have been closely cooperating with the International Criminal Court Prosecutor's Office. We were among the broad group of the OEC participating states who twice invoked the OEC Moscow mechanism. We support the work of the UN Human Rights Council's Commission of Inquiry. Also, we have opened a domestic criminal investigation into Russia's war of aggression. This is a crime penalized under Polish law. Finally, Poland has helped to establish a joint investigation team operating within the EU Agency for, for Criminal Justice Cooperation Framework to collect and preserve evidence of the committed crimes. We should give due consideration to several initiatives put forward by Kiev, such as the Special Tribunal for Crimes of Aggression committed against Ukraine and the international mechanism to provide compensation for damage caused by Russia. Let me reaffirm Poland's solidarity with the people of Ukraine who have shown remarkable courage, resolve, and resilience. They have stood up for their country and their independence with bravery and determination. Now it is our turn to stand up for the principles that protect us all. 
we must hold Russia accountable for the invasion and all the crimes committed in the course of this aggression. Thank you, Madam President. Je remercie Son Excellence, Monsieur Rao, de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence, Monsieur Gabrielius Lansbergis, ministre des Affaires étrangères de la Lituanie. Monsieur le ministre. Madame la Présidente. For the statement on behalf of the Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. The major reason we meet today is that the permanent member of the Security Council, Russia, is openly threatening security and the rules based global order, the very cause this Council was created for. Just a year ago, Russia was sowing lies and distrust. Now it is sowing chaos and death. Day by day, Russia defies the principles of the United Nations and has already become a synonym of brutality, state run terrorism, and genocide. At this very moment, the international community cannot and should not turn away. Yesterday, we all woke up to one more Putin's attempt to escalate aggression. By announcing mobilization, he now has waged the war against his own people, against the people who meant to be the future of the country, but are now turned into the weapons of colonial past. Sowing fear, blackmailing, manipulating are the very few weapons he has left with. Sowing scare is his only tactics. But we shall fear not. We shall meet Putin's desperate sable rattling with calm and resolve. Condemnation alone will not end these crimes. It is imperative that the international organizations use all of their resources to bring Russia's atrocities to the public light and on the charge sheets of international justice. It is our duty to bring Putin to justice. The special tribunal to address the crime of Russia's aggression against Ukraine must be established. Thus, if international organizations will stand up for justice half as strong as Ukraine stands for the universal values, peace will prevail and justice will prevail. Madam President, Russia's war against Ukraine has far-reaching consequences beyond Europe. Ukraine is one of the major exporters of wheat, corn, and sunflower oil. Thus, we shall make it very clear the shortage of food is due to the Russia's aggression against Ukraine and due to the blockade of the Ukrainian ports, and not because of internationally imposed sanctions. And, this, and as if the charge sheet was not full enough, the Moscow regime has now pressed the button of nuclear threats, knowing that we all know that the consequences of the disaster in Zaporizhia may be potentially worse than Chernobyl or Fukushima. But we shall fear not. We shall use all the power of international community to demand from Russia the unconditional withdrawal of its military from Zaporizhia. Madam President, when we say Ukraine, we mean true courage and unbeatable resilience. Ukraine fights for every principle the UN stands for. Ukraine fights for every one of us. Therefore, Madam President, I call on this Council, do not fear to act, fear of your doubt and indifference. I call on every state, we still have a chance to preserve peace and security by taking right decisions to defend the rules-based international order. I call on the entire international community. Accountability matters, and justice cannot be escaped. This is the momentum when we have the chance to decide in what world we want to wake up tomorrow. And just before I go, I want to remind that it's not just only Russia that shall be held accountable. The regime of Belarus shall be on the charge sheet too. Slava Ukraini. I thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence M. Lansbergis de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence M. Vladimir Makei, ministre des Affaires étrangères du Bélarus. Monsieur le ministre. Госпожа Председатель, события на территории Украины – это большая трагедия. Трагедия для страны и для всех, кто лицом к лицу столкнулся с горем и лишениями, которые несут в себе любые военные действия. Беларусь в силу своего исторического прошлого не понаслышке знает цену войны для народа, 
пережившего геноцид и лишившись одной трети своего населения в годы Великой Отечественной войны. Сегодня конфликт разворачивается у наших границ, у наших соседей. Мы твердо убеждены, что только дипломатическим путем, с помощью переговоров, на основе уважения и взаимопонимания, возможно урегулировать любой конфликт, в том числе и этот. События в Украине не возникли внезапно, а стали следствием системного игнорирования рисков безопасности со стороны западных стран в регионе и отказом учитывать интересы и озабоченности вовлеченных государств. Предпосылки к этому формировались в течение многих лет. Более того, массированное санкционное давление со стороны Запада привело к побочным эффектам, которые в нашем регионе неизбежно затронули сферу безопасности. Смею обоснованно утверждать, что санкции существенно сузили, в частности для Беларуси, поле для маневра в, регион, в региональной безопасности. Беларусь постоянно и настойчиво предупреждала об опасной эскалации военно-политической ситуации в нашем регионе, деградации создававшейся десятилетиями системы международной безопасности, обесцениванию международных договоров и соглашений. К сожалению, к нам не прислушались. Трагический результат этой высокомерной позиции мы видим сегодня в Украине. Мы всегда повторяли, нельзя обеспечить безопасность одного государства за счет подавления безопасности другого. Никто не, спринима, не воспринимал это всерьез. Теперь мы пожинаем плоды. Беларусь сделала и продолжает делать все возможное для содействия реализации шагов, направленных на прекращение конфликта и укрепление региональной и международной безопасности. Приведу лишь некоторые факты. В 2014-2015 годах Беларусь предоставила площадку для переговоров и достижения соглашений Минск-1 и Минск-2 по урегулированию конфликта в Украине. И как бы кто ни пытался ерничать на сей счет, как бы кто ни пытался отрицать это, но соглашения тогда снизили уровень военного противостояния в разы на тот момент. В 2014-2019 годах мы обеспечили проведение в Минске более 120 заседаний трехсторонней контактной группы по урегулированию ситуации на востоке Украины. Мы участвовали в диалоге со всеми заинтересованными странами, включая наших европейских партнеров, предлагали конкретные шаги по поддержанию мира и безопасности. В этом зале, наверное, никто не знает об этом, но в 2014 году, когда возник Майдан в Украине, Тогдашний премьер-министр Польши позвонил опальному в лице Европы президенту Лукашенко и попросил его совета, что можно сделать для того, чтобы в Украине прекратить нагнетание напряженности. Президент Лукашенко направил тогда министра иностранных дел в Варшаву, вашего покорного слугу, с конкретными предложениями, которые были выслушаны с интересом. И было сказано, что я посоветуюсь с канцлером Меркель и президентом Алландом. И мы свяжемся с вами. К сожалению, после этого ответа не последовало. Видимо, не хватило смелости работать с Беларусью, которая тогда находилась под санкциями. В этом году на территории Беларуси прошли три раунда российско-украинских мирных переговоров, по итогам которых все участники, и украинские, и российские, однозначно заявили о конкретных позитивных перспективах в плане урегулирования конфликта. К сожалению, через некоторое время этот позитивный процесс был прекращен. С началом конфликта мы предлагали нашим украинским коллегам установить прямой контакт с российской стороной. Были готовы оказать в этом необходимое содействие. Однако наше предложение было проигнорировано. Не знаю почему, но еще задолго до специальной военной операции, которая была начата Россией, еще в декабре 2021 года, Официальные украинские лица объявили Беларусь враждебной страной. Это при том, что мы соседи, что мы хорошо торговали, и э, никогда у нас не было никаких проблем. С конца марта 2022 года Беларусь ввела безвизовый режим для украинцев и всех иностранных граждан, спасающихся от боевых действий в Украине. Им предоставлялась необходимая помощь, в том числе гуманитарная, сразу после их прибытия в Беларусь. С февраля 2022 года Беларусь приняла более 50 тысяч граждан Украины. Всего же с 2014 года наша страна приняла более 200 тысяч граждан Украины. И заметьте, они приезжают не насильно, как это кто-то пытается представить, они едут в Беларусь добровольно. Более того, в целях оказания помощи, причем прибывают через Литву, через Польшу, через прибалтийские страны. 
Более того, в целях оказания помощи гражданам, прибывшим на территорию Беларуси из Украины, президент Беларуси 14 сентября подписал в новой редакции указ о пребывании граждан Украины в Республике Беларусь, в соответствии с которым предусмотрено предоставление украинским гражданам прав наравне с белорусскими гражданами. К сожалению, конфликт не сбавляет свои обороты, идут боевые действия, продолжается бесконтрольная накачка Украины вооружениями из стран Запада, поощряется деятельность украинских экстремистских формирований, проповедующих методы насилия и идеалы неонацизма, всячески подогревается межнациональная ненависть и рознь. Войска НАТО сконцентрированы у границ соседних стран, в том числе стоят у западных рубежей Беларуси, Польши и странах Балтии. Развернута агрессивная антибелорусская кампания, направленная на очернение Минска в контексте этого кризиса. Беларусь причисляют к пособникам агрессора или вовсе выставляют стороной конфликта. Мы говорили и продолжаем говорить, Беларусь никогда не выступала за войну. Но мы и не предатели. У нас есть союзнические обязательства, и мы твердо следуем и будем следовать духу и букве международных договоров, участниками которых мы являемся. При этом Беларусь ответственно заявляет, что ни один белорусский солдат, ни одна единица техники не были направлены в Украину для участия в боевых действиях. Независимые эксперты ОБСЕ подтверждают, что Беларусь не является участником международного вооруженного конфликта согласно нормам и принципам международного права, о котором здесь много говорилось. Все звучащие обвинения в адрес Беларуси со стороны Запада абсолютно беспочвенны и голословны. Минск, как непосредственный сосед, заинтересован быть участником переговоров между Россией и Украиной о стратегическом мирном урегулировании и готов создать все необходимые условия для их продолжения, в том числе и на белорусской земле. И финальные договоренности должны учитывать в том числе интересы белорусской страны. Уважаемый господин председатель, укрепление безопасности национальной, религиозной, региональной, глобальной должно осуществляться не за счет наращивания военного потенциала НАТО, а посредством универсальных, приемлемых для всех двусторонних и многосторонних механизмов по укреплению доверия. Только равноправный и взаимовжительный диалог, направленный на устранение разногласий, способен предотвратить конфронтацию в нашем регионе. И последнее. Все войны рано или поздно заканчиваются за столом переговоров. Это непреложная дипломатическая истина. И чем раньше эти переговоры начнутся, тем лучше. Поэтому удивительно было слышать сегодня заявление некоторых, сидящих за этим столом, о том, что надо продолжать боевые действия, ибо эти заявления абсолютно противоречат здравому смыслу. Благодарю за внимание. Je remercie Son Excellence M. Michael de sa déclaration. Je donne la parole à Son Excellence M. Joseph Borrell Fontelles, au représentant de l'Union européenne pour les affaires étrangères et la politique de sécurité. Français souvent ou anglais, on dépend. Français ou anglais. Le représentant. Madame la ministre, merci beaucoup à la présidence française du Conseil de sécurité pour l'organisation de cette séance cruciale. It's more than six months now into this illegal, senseless and brutal war. As it has been said by many here today, This is a frontal attack on the United Nations Charter and international rules-based order. It's a chemically pure attack on the United Nations Charter. Let's join our voice to the International Court of Justice that has ruled that Russia must halt its invasion immediately. By large majorities, the General Assembly has adopted resolutions calling on Russia to stop its aggression. Morally and politically, Russia has already lost the war. And increasingly, it is losing on the battlefield as well. Ukraine will prevail. The whole world has heard President Putin's latest announcement and his plan to go ahead with sham referenda as a prelude to illegal annexation, which will be never recognized. And also his mobilization of 300,000 reservists and his open nuclear threats. 
By all that, world security is in danger. Global leaders meeting at the United Nations in New York this week must send a clear and united signal that the use of weapons of mass destruction is unacceptable in any circumstances. I am encouraged by the many statements I heard here today about this issue. Regrettably, President Putin is continuing along the dangerous path of escalation. He is trying to intimidate Ukraine and all countries that support Ukraine. But this will fail. It has failed in the past and it will fail again, as all wars of invasion eventually do. But how many more men, women, and children need to die before the Russian president decides to silence his guns? This war is more than a war in Europe. At stake is the protection of weaker states from more powerful ones. Do we want the global rule of law, or do we want the law of the jungle? Do we believe in the spheres of influence, or on the free choice of sovereign states? This goes a tragedy in so many ways. In addition to the terrible casualties and the destruction caused in Ukraine, Russia is dragging the world into an economic recession and a global food crisis. As the European Union, we do what we can to counter this fallout. Our support for global food security amounts to more than 7.7 billion until 2024. We support the Black Sea Grain Initiative facilitated by the Secretary General and Turkey. Together with our European Union solidarity lanes, this has helped to lower global food crisis, but unhappily not to cancel it. Two-thirds of the Ukraine grain exported this way goes to those countries that need it most, not to the Europeans. The core issue today is accountability. Russian armed forces have been terrorizing civilian populations and are committing countless unspeakable crimes, mass murder, destruction, rape, and forced migration. All victims of Russian aggression deserve justice and reparation. We have seen the recent images from the massacres in Izum, follow the pattern we saw in Busha and elsewhere. As Russian troops are expelled, we discover the true horrors of the occupation. As President Zelensky said in the General Assembly yesterday, where there have been crimes, there must be justice. Otherwise, peace will not be possible. We will do whatever it takes to ensure accountability, we rely on the International Criminal Court and on the Ukrainian authorities. We are supporting the ICC financially and technically and assisting the Office of the Ukrainian Prosecutor General by providing training, expertise, and equipment, including on collective evidence. Madam President, ensuring accountability is the responsibility of all of us. We owe this not only to the victims, but also to the next generation, to the future of Ukraine. Because fighting impunity today will contribute to a more secure and just future for all. Thank you. Je remercie Son Excellence, Monsieur Borel Fontelles, de sa déclaration. Il n'y a plus d'oratrice ou d'orateur inscrit. La séance est levée.
Well, I think the United Nations as an organization is uh, making uh, an important contribution uh, to resolving problems created by the Russian aggression against Ukraine. And of course, the Black Sea Grain Corridor is the most uh, evident example of it. Uh, the issue where, uh, we, uh, where we are still having a discussion, not with the United Nations as an organization, but with some of its members, is the creation of the uh, special tribunal for the crime of aggression. But this is mostly uh, predominantly a discussion between us and the International Criminal Court, how to strike a balance between the mandates of the uh, ICC and the need to bring Russia to account for the crime of aggression. I want everyone to understand one simple thing. Even we do not put in question the integrity of ICC and its willingness to deliver justice. But for legal reasons, it's not feasible to try Russia for the crime of aggression at the ICC. This is the only reason why we are pursuing a different solution. If we have to choose between the, between, uh, the ICC and justice, we have to choose justice and find a format which will allow us to try Russia for the crime of aggression. I'm going to see Karim Khan uh, in a couple of minutes. We engage constructively uh, with them and uh, other other countries to find a solution. Why is no one meeting with the Russians? Why is no one meeting with the Russians? I'm going to see Mexican foreign minister in the afternoon and we will discuss the proposal. You mentioned that you, NATO, you mentioned that you're waiting also to enjoy NATO. I think uh, NATO is uh, now willing to join Ukraine. Why is no one meeting with the Russians this week? Or why aren't, why aren't you? President Putin made it clear. He wants to hold shame referendums. He wants, he announced mobilization. He threatened the world uh, with uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Minister Lavrov today was very outspoken and he reiterated all the propaganda, all the, all the positions of President Putin. So uh, why, why seeing them? It's, their position is clear. They chose war. They're not seeking peace. They want to continue with war. They will pay for it. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you so much.
okay? Not okay? Good morning. I've just addressed the United Nations Security Council for one of its uh, most important meeting this year. We live in a dangerous world. One permanent member of the United Nations Security Council is breaching the most fundamental pillar of the international rules-based order, the United Nations Charter. President Putin has announced a partial mobilization in Russia, the organization of illegal referenda in the Ukrainian territories, which are currently occupied by Russia, a threaten again in an unveiled manner with the use of weapons of mass destruction. These actions, this Russia's action, continue threatening peace and security not only in Ukraine but in Europe and elsewhere, and is having severe global consequences in the form of increased food security and rising energy prices. And the world leaders gathered here must be united in condemning this. This is an irresponsible and cynical attempt to undermine the steadfast support to Ukraine. We have shown total disregard for the values of the United Nations. Yes, this is the way it is. President Putin is acting showing complete disregard for the values of the United Nations. And this chamber, as the world community, has to be united to refuse it, and to work for peace and progress. Now, President Putin wants to extend further the cost of war and also to the Russian population through this partial mobilization. One thing is clear, Putin wants to destroy Ukraine and he is not succeeding military. Russia has brought immense suffering upon the Ukrainian people. Every day we learn about uh, atrocities committed by the Russian troops. These are tragic stories of broken families who will never see again their loved ones. I witnessed it myself exhumation of the bodies of the killed people in Busha when I traveled to Ukraine last April. We have seen the account from Mariupol where people were purposely starved. And now the latest image from Izum area are another demonstration of Russia's complete disregard of any international norms principle. And make clear that Russia, its political leadership, and all those who are involved in violation of international law and international humanitarian law in Ukraine will be held accountable. The International Criminal Court can count on the European Union's unwavering support. We are supporting the ICC financially and technically, and assisting the Office of the Ukrainian Prosecutor General by providing training, expertise, and equipment, including in collective evidence. Russia must respect the principles of the United Nations Charter and to reverse these illegal plans. As President Zelensky said yesterday, here at UNGA, Putin is the only one who wants war. This war is his war. Russia jeopardizes in an unprecedented scale international peace and security. But they will not shake our determination, our resolve and unity to stand by Ukraine and our comprehensive support to Ukraine's ability to defend its territorial integrity and sovereignty as long as it takes. But the most important thing all leaders 
gathered here, the international community, sitting at the United Nations, has to issue a strong condemnation of the threat to use nuclear arms, which is an irresponsible and dangerous position taken by President Putin. We stand by Ukraine. Do you support Mexico's uh, just a quick question. You said that uh, the Kremlin wants to destroy Ukraine. Uh, do you think um, uh, Sergei Lavrov is welcome in the Security Council chamber? Do you think he's welcome at the meetings happening around New York? I know uh, you're not meeting with him. Which is the question? Uh, so the question is, is, should he be welcomed here uh, in this con if his country is trying to destroy Ukraine? Do you think he has a, a role to play here? Um, you know, he just gave his remarks and walked out. Uh, Russia is a member of the United Nations, and he has the right to attend the meetings. NPR, Michelle Kellerman. Hi, Michelle Kellerman, NPR. Um, just to follow up on that, what did you make of Lavrov's comments? Um, it seems like this international condemnation. You can't hear? No. I'm I sorry. I cannot did, hear, the, I cannot understand. I'll, I'll do louder, I just, with the microphone, I don't want to screw up that. Um, what do you make of Lavrov's comments? And it seems like international condemnation doesn't move uh, the Russians. Is there anything concrete that the EU is going to do about these annexation plans? Concrete? You mean concrete? Yeah. Look, since the beginning of the war, we are supporting Ukraine by concrete means providing military support and arms. It is the first time in our history that we are providing financing for military equipment to our country in war. We have approved a tougher package of sanctions against the Russian economy. And we are developing an inst intense diplomatic activity in order to explain to the world which are the consequences of this war. These are very concrete things. Sanctions against the Russian economy. We will approve new package of sanctions, although we have already done almost everything possible. We are going to con we will continue supporting Russia, uh, Ukraine military by providing arms in order for them to defend. And here, at the United Nations, and every day, everywhere, we fight the battle of narrative in order to confront the lies of Russia, trying to convince the world that the hunger that they create by blocking the exports of, of Ukrainian grain is the consequences of our sanctions. These are concrete actions. Last question, the stamp Can you elaborate on what the European Union is ready to do in terms of sanction and military supply to Ukraine, and what will be the reaction if uh, Putin follow through with the trade to use uh, uh, nuclear weapons? Look, we know that uh, Putin is being pushed to the corner by the success of the Ukrainian military and they are counteroffensive. He's in a very dire situation, military. That's why he's calling 300,000 reservists and why he's threatening with nuclear uh, weapons. It's certainly a dangerous situation because we don't know what Putin is able to do. We don't know. He should go to the negotiation table and stop the war. But what we see is that he continues bombing Ukraine and he's continuing escalating in the war. So the Council will study a new package of sanctions to a new set of individuals. I cannot tell their names now. And I study tightening the economic sanctions, targeting still more the technological uh, part of our relationship with Russia. By the time being, the sanctions are already very tough and very effective. Almost two-thirds of the Russian civilian planes cannot fly anymore. Just an example. 99% of the Russian factories of car has a stop. 45% of all technological components come from Europe, and they have a stop also. We have to continue, stubbornly, stubbornly, relentless, continue. This is not the moment to weaken our support to Ukraine. This is the moment to continue supporting Ukraine militarily, economically, and diplomatically.